even when it seemed like there is no chance, I was determined to not stop. That last day, every second mattered. I basically had to be hyper-focused and be really calculated about what I did with the time I had. I don't care about any of these punches anymore. You can hit me another 100 times, I'm not gonna stop. This 47-year-old guy with a full-time job just did something absolutely unfathomable. You ran 450 miles over 108 hours, four and a half days. The Biggs Backyard Ultra. Basically setting an entirely new bar when it comes to human capability. How we see ourselves is one of the most important things in the world. I've been running ultras for like 27 years now. I didn't even know that was even feasible. We are also capable of such incredible feats. No matter what your pursuits, we mostly can go so much further than we ever see ourselves going. What is the engine that gets you through four and a half days without sleep and is continuing to propel you? Today's episode is brought to you by the awesome organizations that make this show possible. Harvey Lewis back in the house. Wow, it's uh, like a dream. So good to see you. I can't wait to get into all of this. You're such a delightful presence. We had fun just chatting with you and Kelly, who's here as well, who might pop in a little bit later. We'll see. A lot to unpack, but let's start with when I saw you last, which was a couple months ago in rural Georgia at an event called Running Man that our buddy Jesse Itzler put on. You showed up for a day. You joined us on stage for a panel. You traveled from your home in Cincinnati, you had been teaching. Were you teaching earlier that day or the day before? The day before. The day before. You came out, showed up, did the deal, happy to be there. Then you went back home to Cincinnati to teach because you never miss a class. And then you traveled to Bell Buckle, Tennessee. God knows where that is. <laughs> <laughs> showed up for another round at Big's backyard ultra and towed the line with just three hours of sleep. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Uh, yeah. The sleep aspect of the three hours happened later in that week. It wasn't tied to the Running Man Festival, but it was uh, a busy week and it was a busy week also with teaching and my mother moved to Maryland. So then I had to move some final items out of the house on like that uh, Thursday night before the next day where I went down to Tennessee after my classes. And so it was a, it was a busy week. You know, I was in the first day of the race. I was thinking, did I maybe push a little too much yeah. going down the running man? Yeah. Not exactly an equation to set you up for success at, you know, perhaps the biggest race of your career. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> You're like stacking the deck against yourself. Maybe. But, you know, the thing was so powerful was getting to be down there with you guys. And it was such a cool experience going in, in the saunas. Mm -hmm. I, I had such great time doing the sauna and then just being in the sauna and like meditating on what's coming and just the energy that we had down there with like the panel and the questions from Chris uh, just really sent me off with a lot of positive energy. The the people we ran into down there that yeah. were at the festival, they just were excited to be out there participating. For me, it was electrifying to get me going to the next weekend. Yeah, a little love letter to Jesse and uh, his compadres with the All Day Running Company. They put on this extraordinary event that was a couple hours west of Atlanta, like near the Alabama border. And it was essentially... Coachella for people who are into running on this incredible plot of land where there was all kinds of food trucks and experiences and a main stage with 
all types of panels. That's what we did. But in addition to that, like musical acts and running races of all kinds. And everybody was sort of camping in tents on the perimeter of this field. And the kind of highlight of the whole thing was the world's largest sauna. It was literally like, you know, bigger than this. I mean, it was, I don't know how many square feet this thing was, but I think there was something like over a dozen of the ovens or whatever you call them inside saunas and people lingering around in that and then going back and forth between that and all these other kind of saunas that were peppered around the field (laughs) and these cold plunges. I don't even, what is it? I can't think of anything else to compare it to. Really? It it was wild. I mean, it was crazy and, and, uh, yeah, the, and then you had the giant sauna, and then you had s- some uh, smaller ones that were even hotter. And I right. just remember going into the really hot sauna and then going directly from that to get into the cold plunge. And I don't know, do you do a lot of the cold plunging? I do now. Yeah, I've got one at home, and I've got a I've got a sauna now. Also, that's a recent addition. I so love you it. Just got those it's fantastic. Two, yeah, I've had a plunge for a while. They've been a great support to me, and they just released their own sauna. So we just had that hooked wow. up and online. So it's yeah. pretty great to have that at home. It really is, you know, sort of physical benefits aside, like mental health wise, like it's really been a great addition to my routine. I agree with you yeah. so much. There was also like a trailer that was a cold room. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> only like, Jesse, you know. He is God a God bless him. Yeah, I mean, he goes to the nth degree. For sure. I texted him earlier and asked him if he had any questions for you. So I, I wrote those down. I'm going to hit you up with those. And we should definitely FaceTime him at the end. Oh, that'd be a blast. But in any event, uh, that's still, you know, an energy expenditure on your part to show up and be around a lot of people and you know, give everyone your love and and all of that. I mean, it's the side aspect of your part-time job, not to mention your full-time job as a high school teacher. But I remember leaving that event and, you know, I needed a day of rest after that, you (laughs) know? And and I just went home and got back into my, you know, daily routine. And you had all these other things that you had to take care of before you showed up at this enormous race to throw down just this absolutely all-time legendary performance. Uh, yeah, it's hard to say, but that that a whole event definitely brought some momentum into Biggs as well. Mm-hmm. And it was the energy from the people that I, I just took in so much positive energy. Well, let's not assume that everybody watching or listening to this enjoyed our first episode and spend a moment to just explain what this whole Biggs Backyard Ultra thing is so right. that everyone understands what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, this is a race that began in this rural area of Tennessee uh, that was created by the iconic uh, race director, Laz Lake, Gary Cantrell. Uh, He uh, basically came up with this vision about 50 years before he put it into action when he was back in high school. And he dreamed up, well, I'm not the fastest person on the track team, but I sure can run a long time. And I think if I could just have a race, he was thinking to himself, where every runner had to cover 4.167 miles, which equates to 100 miles over 24 hours, then I think I have a chance of, of maybe winning. Mm-hmm. So it was self-serving, this idea. Yeah. <laughs> Les is He's one of the, the great, great characters of all time in, in sport or just in general. I mean, he is an enigma and fascinating for so many reasons. People may be familiar with him from the Barclays Marathon um, documentary that I think it's on Netflix. Is it's, it on Netflix? It's free now. Oh, is like it free? You can look on YouTube. It used to be uh-huh. on Netflix. And uh, it's uh, the, the race that eats at young. Right. So, I mean, it's a classic, almost like a cult-like following of the film and stuff and like around Barkley. Laz is full of many contradictions and mysteries. Uh, and he's just an absolute wizard when it comes to his his writing. And with this race, he puts out a, usually a new post every hour. I don't know how he, he manages to do that, where he'll like describe, you know, what's happening in a race, you know, like take some element of it. And it's really interesting to read how he puts it out into his own words. He's sort of a, a mashup between a backwoods survivalist who's living like off the grid 
mixed with this kind of philosopher king sensibility to him that is confounding because he doesn't appear to be someone with that type of intellect. But I think, wasn't his dad like a NASA scientist or something yeah, like that? Yeah, his dad was a, a NASA scientist and he helped to engineer the landing for the lunar module. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, many people might assume that he's just like a hillbilly living up in the hills, but he he scored a 36 on the ACT. So he had a perfect <laughs> yeah, score. Yeah. <laughs> so he's quite a And he's he was quite a coach mind. for a long time, he wasn't was, he? Yeah, he was an accountant, and he also coached with the local sports mm-hmm. teams for years and years and years. And one of his greatest dreams in life is to give a million dollars in charity. And I don't know his entire accounting for that, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's already surpassed that mm-hmm. with the race that he put on during the pandemic. This uh, virtual race across Tennessee he had over like 20,000 people sign up for it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but he's really he's someone who gives a lot to the whole like ultra running. Uh, he, he just adds so uh, such a layer of additional like races like i mean he's got all these he's got like eight different races and they all have some unique element to them right so the bigs is a race that takes place on his property right it's like yeah it's 150 acres that he owns so he basically he doesn't have to get permits or anything like that it's like on his own private land right it's actually named after his dog big right who he rescued a big giant pit bull uh, dog had showed up on the front of his uh, land uh, shot. And when he first saw it, he thought there's no way this dog is going to survive. And he ended up living to be 16, which is really wow. old for a big dog. He just passed away the last year. Mm. But this race that began in 2011 has now spread to 73 countries, and there's more than 400 backyard ultras across the globe. And in addition to that, now more people hit uh, running uh, 100 miles under 24 hours in the backyard format than all other 100 milers last wow. year combined. It's astonishing, but also not surprising because it is a brilliant conceit. Essentially, you're running a four mile and change loop on the hour, every hour. Everybody starts at the same time and people you know, kind of fade away when they can't make the one hour time cut off until there's just two people left until that one person falls off and then there's a winner and the winner has to then stop. They can't continue, which is an added little interesting quirk because if you win a backyard race, the other competitors aren't quite sure how much was left in the tank. So even if you you said, oh, I did this many laps or whatever, you can't really gauge whether they were able to go further, which creates a little bit of a question mark when you line up with the world's best for this kind of thing, right? And oh, then the, yeah. sec- the second thing that I think is really interesting is that, first of all, everybody gets it. Like, you can understand this. Like, even if you have no connection to running, you're like, okay, I understand it. It's sort of like a game show. It lends itself perfectly to a format like television where it's gamified in a certain way, right? And this year... There was a live stream. I think there was when you won two years ago also, right? Yeah, yeah. Two years ago, Solomon actually set up a film team. uh, And then this year, uh, a videographer from France, Fabian, he actually had a a whole team there. So, I mean, it was was quite incredible. They had like drones. And honestly, I really just loved having the opportunity for people to be able to see the race transpire. Yeah. And so like, you know, once we entered into the woods, there were only like maybe three standing like cameras that that were not like, uh, you didn't really even notice it much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once in a while, there would be someone with a camera kind of like run into the woods, falling behind you. It was nice to know that my students and my family could like see what was happening you know, uh, versus just hearing third hand, like what was going on in the race. So like, I, I felt like I was connecting with people back home by having that there. And most of my ultras, like throughout this entire year, there's not been any other ultra I've ran where you have that sort of like video coverage, right? which was amazing. Yeah. 
so the coverage from your point of view was relatively unobtrusive and you had had this experience two years prior. So you knew, okay, this is being documented, but the live stream was handled extremely professionally. Like they did an incredible job. And I don't know how much awareness you have around this, but as somebody who is watching from afar and kind of following along on social media and checking in on the live stream, there was a groundswell movement that took place, probably in large part due to Jesse's mm -hmm. just unbridled enthusiasm because he was on Instagram constantly on stories. Like, you gotta, everybody's gotta check out this live stream. You have no idea what's going on. There's never been anything like this before. Like, he just was going <laughs> on and on and on. And there was a ripple effect where all kinds of people from all over the world, people who have no connection to running, let alone ultra running, were hopping on board and sharing stories and spreading the word about this event that was taking place as it was sort of mounting, like as it progressed, like not just on the last day, like on day two and a half, it felt like it really hit like a pivotal threshold. And it became like a mainstream thing. I don't know how many people were watching this live stream, but it was a lot. And I just noticed the larger world jumping on board to celebrate this incredible thing that they'd never heard about before, which of course, after your victory, translated into all kinds of mainstream press. Like you got an article on CNN and in The Guardian. Like that must have been surreal to you because this is an event, even amidst, you know, ultra events that is so rooted in the history and the organic nature of what ultra running is. Like this is, hey man, there's no frills here. There's no prize money. This is not UTMB. Like this is like as, you know, backwoods as it gets by design, by Laz's very design. And yet it captured the imagination and the fascination of the world. It was something I'm speechless about even now. The race format is like nothing I've ever seen before in the sense of like, it just uh, causes like this growth of like people following mm -hmm. it each day, more and more people follow it. And I mean, I, I, once I got home in Ohio, like there were people coming up to me in my city and saying, like, I don't run, but I got addicted to that. And I didn't get any work done. <laughs> yeah, people, week. people, a lot of people <laughs> yeah, are yeah. like, man, I was supposed to work right. today. And like, I, you I know, I'm like work. watching the show like yeah. it's a Christopher Nolan movie or right. something. It's so funny. And then people come up, they'd be like, man, I would go to bed and I would wake up the next morning and you guys are still running. Yeah. <laughs> like what? And so, yeah, this particular race format, it just causes this continual build, build, build of, of more and more people kind of seeing what, what's going to mm -hmm. happen now. It's sort of like if Mr. Beast was designing an ultra race, right? That would this be would be it, right? I'm yeah. sure your students are all oh, Mr. Yeah. Beast fans, oh, yeah, right? Definitely. Or it's the ultra distance version of squid game basically right yeah nobody dies well i guess they could <laughs> yeah, but right. like you know nobody's trying to kill anybody and we have kelly here who actually was a contestant on the reality tv show version of squid game yeah and i was saying to you beforehand like there's a weird venn diagram overlap between you two because there is some shared dna with yeah you know somebody who would sign up for something like that and what you do yeah, yeah, we definitely train together and we have like these kind of quirky ways we do training uh, sometimes. Like for the squid game, we, we, we kind of anticipated that there would probably be this red light, green light game. Uh -huh. So we would be out running in the neighborhood and hopefully the neighbors weren't watching, but we like, I'd be like, all right, red light. <laughs> and then she'd have to stop and like hold her pose. And then, uh -huh. yeah, we have fun with it. It's nice to have a partner that's like kind of shares some of the ventures together. So... You ran 450 miles over 108 hours, four and a half days, and completed this race just before seven o'clock on October 25th. Previously, two years prior, you had done 85 laps, right? Yeah. How many miles was that? 354. 354. You won that. We talked about that last time. Um, but this is a big difference yeah. 85 and 108 laps? Is that, yeah, no, 108 really, laps, right? Really well, that's right. That's not an incremental improvement, RV. 
It's wild. You know, it's very interesting. Like this race actually happened from 2011 to 2021. No one had gone over 300 miles. Um, this year, 22 runners went over 300 miles, which is incredible. So, what like, do you make uh, of that? The whole equation is uh, it's important to look at every single runner. So we had 75 runners from like, I guess, about 45 countries. And so it's really important that every runner matters in terms of the final distance that's able to be achieved. And it's wild how that's uh, the case, but it, it is because the more runners who make it further, it pushes more runners further mm -hmm. and the next runners further. So we had six runners who made it to 400 miles, which is really phenomenal. And then we had Eeyore who made it uh, and pushed me to as assist to 450. Right. I want to talk a little bit about him. Uh, he certainly is deserving of oh, quite yeah. a bit of celebration. And he's young, like he's like 27, yeah. I think. Yeah, absolutely. So in many ways, you know, perhaps the heir apparent to this little subculture, right? Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how he develops over the years. Oh, yeah. And he's Canadian-Ukrainian, right? Yeah, right. He lives in B.C., Actually, we did a race together in Alberta in August. It's the Canadian Death Race. Uh -huh. And it's just an iconic place on the planet. Grand Cache is about four or 5,000 people. And you go up and down about three pretty sizable mountains. But he beat me in that race by two hours. Right. Yeah, and he almost he, he just missed the, the record on the course, which is an old course, the old ultra, by just minutes and, it, and it's pretty much because they had a mismarking on the course which caused him to, to miss that i saw a quote where laz said something like it was a standoff at the very end between the clearly stronger runner meaning him <laughs> and the guy who just won't quit meaning you right right, right. so how did you emerge victorious? I know there's an interesting story around the lap that preceded the final lap that involved a little mental hijinks. There's so much to the whole thing. Because um, we probably at some point want to talk about the sleep deprivation. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, that's a little we're going to get into that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that last day was uh, just a matter of seconds. Like every second mattered. And so when it got to like, we were beyond the world record and there were like four or five runners still left. Then I knew I basically had to be hyper-focused and I had to be really calculated about what I did with the time I had. So, I mean, I was just finishing laps at that point, like by maybe five minutes, like so 55 minutes. And in this course, in this race, uh, of course, you get, that gives you five minutes to possibly do what you want to, and you have to be back in the corral when the whistle goes and uh, ready to go again. So in that four or five minutes, I was like laying down and putting my feet up, getting ice on my body because it was a warm day. And I was even taking like 60 second naps, like not every hour, but I mm -hmm. did take a couple of 60 second naps because I was so tired. I could literally just fall asleep and it felt like gold to me. Like I was like, wow, I get up 60 seconds later. I'm just so thankful I could get 60 seconds of sleep. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So when it got down to uh, Bartos, uh, the, the Polish runner, and Eeyore and I, there was like three of us. Uh, then, you know, there were some signs I saw of Bartos, just a phenomenal runner. He said something to me. He said, like, I, I wanted to go home. <laughs> you know, he said, it, like, at one point, and I knew he was kind of like uh, on the edge of like, he went further because I think he said at one point, I'm just going to go one more lap. And then he like, I was mm. like, oh, you're still here. It's like another lap beyond that. So he kept going. But I could tell like he was really starting to feel it. And Eeyore, I, after the race, people told me that they had seen that he had said some things in front of the camera, but I didn't know any of that, like in terms of like, you know, maybe his foot was bothering him. Mm. I was just so focused on just getting myself reset with that five minutes and like not falling down on the trail that I was not like entirely like I was just focused on making it just keep going. I wasn't like really reading everything he was saying at the time. But 
the lap previous to the victorious lap, didn't you sprint off the line and, you know, yeah. try to like, you know, screw with him a little bit, like yeah. by putting in like a huge effort all of a sudden? Well, no, maybe like the, that was the last lap I think I went off, but maybe I did do it that lap too. I basically got in front of, front of him. In this course, there's like a 300 meters, 400 meters on the road before you uh, enter the woods. Mm -hmm. So I went off the line pretty quickly, but he caught up to me going down this hill on the road. And then he was in front of me and I passed him going up the hill. And then when I passed him, I ran really fast mm. back through the, the starting gate. And at that point, you know, I was really determined to give it a, a strong lap. And part of that was I wanted to reset anything I wanted to do for like the road laps because I was the last trail lap. But also part of it was to send a message that like, I'm still here. <laughs> you yeah. know, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. And that was kind of my logic. Mm. And he had a little trouble. So when he got up there, I don't think he saw me run through the camp really fast, but I know he like had uh, you know, stopped for a moment and was just like, maybe teetering on the idea of like, you know, what's my purpose of continuing at this point? And Laz said to win, go get him. Uh, mm -hmm. And then he went. And to his credit, he ran a very strong lap and came back around. And so, you know, we wouldn't have gone out to the road had he not put in that effort. Mm -hmm. I mean, he almost caught me on that trail that lap, nevertheless. So why do you think that you were able to beat him? Ultimately, you're saying? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, one other interesting thing about that, in that whole race, that was the first lap I finished first across the whole 107 laps. Mm. Like, I had never done that in that particular race at that That's day. That's interesting in its own yeah, right. Yeah, it is. There's a psychology to that. What did I beat him with? It's hard to say exactly, but uh, I was determined to not stop. I mean, everyone that went there had some idea of wanting to go really far. And I would say at least a couple dozen people wanted to win the race and had similar ideas that I did, but I just never lost that idea, that vision. I just, even when it seemed like there is no chance, like all the odds are stacked against you, uh, especially for example, in like day one and day two, like I was really feeling tired. Day one, you said, was your worst day. Yeah, I was, you felt the worst I on was, the first day. Yeah, well, actually, day one and day two, like were I was more tired, and I knew I was more tired than any previous year I'd done the race. So, like knowing where you've that's been got to before, rent space in your head. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you're, then you're not supposed to feel this bad this early. You're not supposed yeah. to feel like I'm. I'm like, well, I remember the 2021 year, and when I was in day two, I was just kind of like felt like I was almost floating. And I remember this year and I'm like, oh my God, I'm feeling kind of tired here. You know, it's like, I feel the tiredness. Maybe I should have gone like, to running yeah, man. Like, <laughs> maybe I should have gone to running man. Yeah. Maybe I should have been like moving things on Thursday nights. Maybe I should have taken a day off from work versus driving down after work on Friday. Um, there were a lot of things that kind of went into my mind. In the night before the race, one of the three worst sleeping nights ever, I only got like three hours of sleep. And I woke up at like 2 a.m. and I just laid there and I just, my mind was like thinking about everything. I couldn't calm my mind down and I couldn't fall back to sleep. So I went to the starting line knowing that I only got three hours of sleep going into the race that I will need the most amount of sleep <laughs> of in my whole life. <laughs> so that is not a good omen per se. And then in the first three days, I didn't sleep at all. Like I actually laid down and I really believe there's a true physiological and mental impact from just laying there with your eyes shut. I, I, I could say maybe it's like 60% or a little more than that of the same benefit of actually sleeping. Because if you're awake, it's different than just laying there with your eyes shut. Um, but I couldn't sleep at all for three days. And so it wasn't until the fourth night John Noel and I, another uh, American runner from our, our team, he and I were running together and uh, I was doing like 55 minute laps. And we, we just got to this point where I was able to like fall asleep for like two minutes. And it just was like, oh my God, this is the best sleep I've had my whole life. <laughs> like just sleeping for two minutes because going for three days with no sleep. Was that by intention that you weren't going to sleep for the first three days oh, or that's no. just the way that it 
played no, out. No, it's just the way it played out. Like I practiced sleeping. I talked to uh, Todd at the uh, Running Man Festival, oh, and he right. had some really great ideas about how to like you know breathe before you fall asleep. All these things were really like things that I should have done better to practice that element leading up, like for a couple months. But yeah, in my my training at lunchtime, I'd go and lay down for five minutes in my classroom. Next You're to trying the, to train yourself to, to fall asleep quickly. Yeah, I would fall asleep. I could literally do it in my classroom. I fall asleep three minutes, bam, get back up. Even like on runs, I did like running. I go to a park. I like lay down in the middle of like the park for like three, five minutes and get up. But when it came to the race, I was just so worked up. And then after like day two, I'm drinking like Tailwind and, and Coca-Cola and drinks that have caffeine in them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that probably also like added an element of not being able to fall asleep. It was my dream to want to fall asleep and like sleep more than ever before. Because there's another story I'll share about it in Australia with that whole like madness of not getting enough sleep. Go ahead, Go ahead. share it. Yeah. Okay, so basically I was in Australia this summer and we did this uh, incredible race. Tim Walsh, uh, dead cow golly. Tim's got this ranch in the country of uh, Queensland. It goes back to 1877. So it's kind of uh, ironic that a rancher, you know, he, he has like a, a cattle farm, would, would recruit a, a vegan from America uh -huh. to come and run in his race. But yeah, he was just a phenomenal guy. His race attracted like uh, runners from New Zealand, from South Africa, and the top runners from Australia. So uh, the race went uh, to a new world record, which was kind of interesting because this is just a race that no one had really heard of outside of Australia too much. And we were able to push it to uh, Phil Gore beat the Belgium record and Sam Harvey was his assist. So those two guys, and I was the third runner. What happened to me is I made it to 375 miles and I was, uh, again, struggling with the sleep. And also I had gotten really dehydrated in the, in the middle part of the day. So for about 10 hours, I hung on by literally like strings, just getting myself into the corral with like minutes to go. At 375 miles, I finally uh, tapped out and I told our runners, we were out in the middle of the, the woods uh, on the road. I said, you guys, best of luck to you. As soon as they went off like uh, 50 meters, I started the greatest hallucination hallucinations I've ever had in my whole life. Like the most incredible, I never had anything even remotely close to this. I mean, I had seen shadows that I, my brain interprets as other things, but this is a whole nother level. It was like stranger things. Like the grass became grass people. There were the trees were alive, the whole forest, like the sounds like were super acute. And then I would like sort of fall asleep for like just a millisecond. And I wake up like this as I'm standing there. I wasn't scared. I was, I was totally aware of what was happening. But it's just like everything was an absolute hallucination. Right. That was just strange. I'd never experienced that like in your running. your brain's releasing its DMT I, it into your system. It was unreal. Were you running while that was happening? No, or? I had paused. Was, I was just walking uh, okay. and kind of like talking to the woods. <laughs> like, oh my God. Yeah. Like actually, if I go back to that place ever again, I'm not sure I'll ever go back to that again. I think I can actually run through that. Like I think it would just be like, a wild experience, but I could just still run through that whole thing. You're like a psychonaut <laughs> exploring the outer edges of sleep deprivation. Right. The science is in people, hot and cold therapy. In other words, using sauna and cold water immersion has so many powerful benefits like lowering inflammation, reducing muscle soreness, boosting energy, and elevating mood. But the thing is, DIY ice baths are this colossal hassle and basically just impractical, making the whole affair unsustainable, which is a problem solved by the guys at Plunge who pioneered the all-in-one solution, this gorgeous, elegant, modern tub that's easy to install indoors or out with cooling and filtration built right into it. So it basically requires almost zero maintenance. And I use it almost every single day, which has greatly impacted my physical health and I gotta say, vastly improved my mental well being. 
The Plunge team now also offers a beautiful sauna for the ultimate hot cold experience. This gorgeously designed addition to your space. I got mine up and running recently, and I gotta say, I can no longer imagine life without it. It really has been an absolute game changer for my physical health, of course, but also all these profound benefits to my mental well being. To learn more and get your own cold plunge tub or sauna, visit plunge.com and hit the link in the description below and use code RICHROLL to get $150 off your purchase. Showing up only on three hours of sleep, then not sleeping for the first three days of this whole thing. And then all told, like your cumulative sleep for the entire bigs? Four and a half days, not counting the three hours before, would have been like, it's maybe like 20 or 25 minutes, 20, 20 25 minutes, minutes total for, for four the and whole a half days, four yeah. and a half days. Yeah. Something like that. And I didn't have even a single hallucination like during that whole period. I don't know what happened. I mean, I didn't, in 2021, I would sort of hear sometimes noises, like someone's running behind me or I would see some sort of light and I'd like interpret it as like a dog or whatever. I didn't even have that. Like in this one, I had like no hallucinations. Mm. Uh, but on the fourth night, I did start to go into this like phase of being like sort of running, sort of dreaming. So I would fall asleep and like trip a bit. And somehow I didn't ever fall down on the road. This race, which I didn't mention if someone's just tuning into this for the first time, you've got 11 hours on a trail and then it has 13 hours on the road. The nighttime, so, you're on the roads at night. Exactly. Right? So on the trail, the trail is more difficult. Like there's 450 feet of climbing. You have rocks and roots and you have areas that if you fall, you're going to possibly hurt yourself pretty good. On the road, you have basically maybe 150, 180 foot of like climbing and descent. And you have an out and back of 2.1 miles. So if you fall, you're just going to scratch your elbow, your knee or whatever. Mm -hmm. In that mode, I was starting to like go into a different mental state at times. Like with John running next to me, I would start to like say things that didn't make sense. Like I was like, I don't have streaming services. And like, <laughs> tell me like, I remember saying that. I'm like, why did I say that? Like I wasn't, like, and John would be like, what are you talking about, Harvey? It was just like uh, this uh, like flow of thought that just like you get in the dreamlike state where mm -hmm. you're, that's very interesting. It's like, it's like you're dreaming, but you're awake. And so like your flow of thought is just uncontrolled. Like it was, I was not in any control of my flow of thought in many times on that fourth night. And in fact, at about five hours into the fourth night, uh, I said to John, I was like, how many of these laps have we done? And he's like, I think like uh, two. And I was like, yeah, I think two as well. And then we looked at our watches. Wow, we've, we've done five of these and we <laughs> forgot like where'd they go? I don't know where. Like, so that was something totally new to me. I mean, I've been running ultras for like 27 years now. I didn't even know that was even feasible to do something like that. And I mean, I saw somewhere in a publication uh, where, you know, you get some like, different feedback from different folks. And someone said like, well, Harvey really was impressed with what he did with some of these things, but like that sleep stuff was just total luck. <laughs> you know, And I was like, well, you know, the funny thing is, is like really none of this is really genetics or luck. A lot of it really is uh, building up like your endurance. And like when I first started doing this, uh, when I was 20, I ran a 24 hour race. And I can remember like the hardest thing of that 24 hour race was surviving the night. I remember getting a 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And it's like, is something that is like having a car on top of yourself. And you're like trying to just stay awake with everything you have. And so it took many years in these backyards. I can remember going back to Courtney and I in 2020, where I tapped out at like 270 some miles. And that, that was like a, a large part of that was building up like the ability to endure like that sleep deprivation mm -hmm. as well. Could you have imagined then that there would be a day where you would go 180 miles further than that? No way. No way. I mean, honestly, when I first came to that race, it was so funny because they were handing out the race numbers. I just remember them saying like, yeah, well, maybe like it was just meant as a joke. Like maybe someone will, you know, I think it's going to go to 300 miles. And like, uh, everyone's like, no, no, I'd never do that. And I remember back to when I was running these 24 hour races and I thought I would really love to run 130 miles. And that seemed like some 
giant Mount Everest so far away. It was insurmountable for myself at 20. Like, I mean, that was, I ran 81 miles like in that 24 hour race. And I mean, it took me five years to get to breaking five hours in a marathon. It took me another like 14 years to get to breaking three hours uh, mm-hmm. from that point. So it's 17 a, years to qualify for Boston. 17, you got, I mean, your whole you life is an mind. ultra. It's like a life's commitment. It you is. know, it's not just showing up and suddenly you have this capacity or this prowess that, you know, you didn't even know that you had. You've been working on this for the better part of your entire life. Yeah, it's been a long journey. It's definitely been an ultra experience. And I love like the Count of Monte Cristo and like that hammering through that that tunnel. And like uh, we all have tunnels in life and we all have something to hammer through. And just that's where I, I was at when I finished, when I was on my last loop in, in the bigs this year. And I was coming back and I knew at, at the moment where I actually saw there was no Ehor. And I was like, I cannot believe that this was a dream that I had for so long. And for this whole year, it was something I really just envisioned so strong. But it was like the probabilities of getting there seemed so infinitesimally small when you thought about like all the competition all the the runners all the things that could go wrong i just had to like say a prayer and like just slow down and like uh just soak in the energy of like my surroundings and then just be grateful for having that opportunity what do you extract from that about human capability that is the place uh, that we are all so capable of such incredible feats. And no matter what your area of specialization or what your pursuits, we mostly can go so much further than we ever see ourselves going. And it's so important where we see ourselves. How we see ourselves is is one of the most important things in the world. So, I mean, for example, I always vision myself as well, I, I'd love to be a fast marathoner, but I always envisioned myself as being like, maybe for a long time, it was like a four-hour marathoner. And then somewhere along the line, I thought, well, I'm, I started to see myself as maybe a, a 3.30 and then maybe 3.15. And then I, well, maybe I can be a sub three-hour. And then I was like, well, wow, maybe I can be, so I got to 2.45, 58. And now I'm like, you know, I'm not sure if that's like my pinnacle or maybe I can actually go further than that, even though I'm at my age right now, 47, it seems counterintuitive. And I have my PRs from four years ago. You know, maybe it is actually possible if I concentrate my energies and and also adopt like the knowledge that's available to make that happen. Is that on the bucket list to try to go back to the marathon and, and just throw down and see what you can do? I think I'd love to do that. Yeah, yeah I'd love to do that. I think uh, this year, I'm not sure about this year. I've got a lot of things on the agenda, a lot of races, uh, but I would definitely like, I wouldn't want to sacrifice the ultras I'm doing now, but I think it's actually possible, which I've done in the past. I've always gotten faster in the marathon. At the same time, I'm getting faster in ultras. And a lot of times people think, oh, it's not possible because if you're working on 100 mile race, no way you're going to get faster in a 5K or a marathon. But I think it's actually possible to perhaps have them work side by side. However, for like getting sub 245, I'll probably have to dedicate myself for like maybe three and a half months or three months to real specific training. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I would love to do something like that. Maybe, maybe like when I hit 50 or... <laughs> It'd be super know, interesting. See. You could we'll you could literally just discard the weekly long run. Like right, you right. got, like I got the endurance part covered. Yeah, yeah, All I'm yeah. going to do is go to the track like three times a week <laughs> and just throw down, you know, 400s at yeah. race pace or whatever and just forget about any distance stuff whatsoever and just fine tune some speed and try to get your tempo up to par and then yeah. just show up, you know. I, I think I'm going to need your, uh, your sauna, <laughs> your cold know. plunge. <laughs> I think I'm gonna need yeah, it. some cold plunging might mm-hmm. be involved. Um, I got to ask, and I'm sure you've been asked this many times, but again, back to the quirk, like when the other guy doesn't show up for the next lap, you win, but the story that isn't quite told is how much further you could have gone. Could you have kept going? And if so, how much further do you think you could have run? How many more laps, loops, whatever you call them? 
Laps? Loops? <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah. Yeah, it's laps. Yeah, we call them actually yards. Yard, yards. Yards, technically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I got into this incredible space in the fourth night. Like, uh, I felt like I found some sort of frequency with running. And I feel like there's a mathematic equation to it. And it's like with pacing. If you hit a certain pace mark in your marathon, uh, you can go so much faster than if you miss it by like your mile splits by mm -hmm. even like 10 seconds, you can throw that off. So I feel like I hit some sort of frequency where I just felt like I could go forever. But uh, there are so many things that can go wrong as well. So by the time I, I hit that fifth day of running on the road, I definitely felt like it was possible we could have just kept on going that whole night uh, because only major impediment possibly at that moment would have been like sleep deprivation. But I felt like it was possible. So we maybe could have gone back to the trail mm -hmm. for a uh, fifth day, I guess it would be. <laughs> yeah. So then you would have the element of the trail again. And so like that can be tricky. Like, I mean, if I didn't fall at all the first three days that I can remember. Um, but the fourth day I fell a bunch more and I started falling like, the more towards like one, two, three in the afternoon. Because your depth perception That's what gets thrown I thought, off from the yeah. sleep deprivation. Yeah. I was wearing my road shoes on, on the trail. So I also like beat my road shoes up at that moment because I had worn them through the night where I like fall asleep and like on the road, but I was also wearing them on the trail. So that probably also didn't help things. But yeah, you could entirely not knock yourself out by falling on some rocks or something like that, like uh, Mori Mori did like in 2021. And then also in 2021, I fell down on the third day and like just fell poorly on my hand. I'm really good at falling. I fall a lot, <laughs> but, yeah. but I fell and broke my hand. So this time I was really good about my falling. It just, uh, you have to be so careful because there are any particular points if you're not getting uh, enough nutrition every hour then you're just gonna like mm -hmm. you're just not gonna be able to go so i mean you have to like constantly be aware of your like nutrition you have to be aware of like uh you're pacing yourself you can't get like overly carried away like i was maybe showing at the start of lap i wouldn't want to do that like a sprint through the whole loop mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and one trip on a route. Yeah, and, then you and can you go just, down and you're out. You could. Yeah. yeah. So you have to be really conscious of what you're doing. So I feel like it is definitely possible that we could have gotten back to that fifth day. And then I feel like it's possible to go beyond that too. So I, I really didn't see any finish. I was just going to go until the last person. So, I mean, yeah. I, I was prepared to just go so as you're far gonna, as it you're took. not going to lay a number on the table oh, here. No, 550? There's, there's no, what are we talking about, a, Harvey? A, a, as far as... It, 600? <laughs> I think that a lot is possible. I think it's, it may be possible to even do something like that. Wow. For sure. Yeah, I think it's possible. A lot of athletes in these multi-day events suffer from all kinds of digestion problems. The stomach gets upset, they can't hold calories down, and that ends up, you know, basically, you know, toppling the best of them. But you didn't seem to have any kind of issues with that, despite taking in something like 40,000 calories or however <laughs> much food you ate over the course of this four and a half day period. Like, to what do you attribute that? And is that also something that you practice and try to train and prepare for? Most definitely. Like I can remember being out on the course and hearing other runners like squabble about digestion issues. Like maybe, I don't know what percent, I heard at least 10% complaining about yeah, some digestion, digestion issues. So it is a big, big, big impact to be able to like consume 300 or more calories every hour. And then, I mean, 40,000 calories across four and a half days, like they that's a lot of calories. Yeah. I mean, that's an incredible amount. I don't really practice it like uh, in terms of like my monthly routine of like training. It's like these races help to inform that. So like doing bad water in the summertime where the temperatures are over 120 degrees, I get a real good sense of like what I can consume at any temperature mm -hmm. possible. I mean, I've done uh, races ranging from like Bad water in 2021, I think it was like close to 128 to like the Arrowhead 135, 
which you know that race can get down below zero quite far. Uh, so it's like more than a hundred and some degrees of like temperature range. And uh, with bigs, uh, the plant-based foods make such an incredible impact. Like not having the dairy or the meat, it's easier for my body to digest things quickly. So I'm able to digest mm-hmm. more calories quicker. And if it's warm out, that's where it's also, you know, it definitely gonna help you even more because I don't have like any issues with like the speed of digestion and the inflammation too. Like that's another thing. I, I know, you know, at least another runner, I heard, they had to actually change their shoes uh, to like, because their yeah. feet swelled up so much. They had to borrow another European shoes uh, for size 14 and a half. I think that they started like a 12 size. So, I mean, it's like, I don't know if that was entirely attributed to like the nutrition, um, but I can say when I do see other runners, like I know that they talk about like swelling their lower legs um, near their shins and ankles. And I didn't have any type of swelling in the race. During the race point, I had no no swelling that was visible. So like that has an impact on like minimizing your your risk of injury and also like impacting your performance. I try to eat foods that are easy to digest. So I'll eat like lots of fruits, but I also have like soups with noodles. I'll have like avocado wrap with like hummus. I have like uh, lentil soup. So I'm also getting protein in there. If mm-hmm. I'm only running like a a hundred mile race, I'm like have zero care about like really all the dynamic of like the makeup. It's more important like the number of calories. I'm getting like salt and fat. Uh, but in these longer races, I'm also being more mindful about getting protein mm-hmm. and like uh, a race over a hundred miles, like especially bigs, that I'm trying to eat something more than just a gel or like a uh, tailwind. I'm also trying to get like some real food in me, maybe as much as like every two hours. But I know a lot of runners would have difficulty doing that if they didn't get practice with that. But I've just been doing it for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe if I think back to when I was doing that in my early 2000s, I would come back and just be like, oh, my stomach is like roaring. But I've conditioned my stomach to be able to like just eat a burrito from Chipotle and then just go. Yeah, it's like kind of wild how you can condition your, your body and your mind to adapt. Talk to me a little bit about the recovery. We're not that many years distanced from a period of time in which conventional wisdom was if you ran a marathon, then you should pretty much, you know, take the rest of the year off because it's going to take a long time for your body to bounce back. Then we enter this world of ultras and then the idea being like, well, if you're going to run a 50 mile race, a hundred mile race, like maybe just do that once a year. You, my friend, competed in 10 ultras this year. And not just like, we're not talking 50 kilometer races. We're talking insanely long distances. And you seem to have this preternatural ability to bounce back and be right back on your feet, back teaching, back running into your daily routine without more than a blink of an eye after a race like this. So walk me through what is going on here. I've kind of gotten a full formula, but movement is really important. So for me, like the day after a race, I think even getting out to walk for like 20 minutes is like dynamite compared to if you were to not do anything at all. So some sort of movement is is critical daily to our self-existence. Like, I mean, I know this from like breaking my neck back in 2004 from that experience, I didn't take any painkillers after I left the hospital. And I was feeling a lot of discomfort, especially mm-hmm. the first like week. But what I found was like not moving was far more painful than moving my body and walking. So walking is actually like lotion to your body. Like it is like it is incredible. So with these these races, I do like a one mile run after the race. It kind of keep my run streak, although that kind of- Like the same day or uh, no, you the, mean the, the following next, day? The next day, okay. yeah. The, All right, thank <laughs> you. Day. And then I, I basically am not going very fast. I mean, it's a slow mile. It's like usually over a 10 minute mile. And uh, then I'll like just build onto that. So if it's like a, a shorter race, like maybe a, a hundred mile race, maybe I feel pretty good and I'll just go run like- 
you know, three or four miles, or I'll run to work three miles, run home from work three miles. I have like that run streak to work is like 10 and a half years now. Without missing a day. Without missing a day. 10 and a half years. 10 and a half years. Of running to and from work. To and from work every day. I love it. I honestly say like, well, if someone were to offer me, if I, I'd have to give it up for a Ferrari, I would like not take the Ferrari. I, lo- I love the Ferrari. It's a very nice car. I have a hard time <laughs> seeing you in a Ferrari. That yeah. feels like very anac- you know, yeah, anachronistic. It's, 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 no, yeah, I, it, <laughs> we saw one last night. We were having a debate about what kind of car it was. I was like, that's a Ferrari. And Kelly's like, that's not a Ferrari. Mm. <laughs> but the motion to, is like lotion. It's real critical. Like movement is so important for our bodies, whether you're able to do it at a higher level with yoga or uh, you're just simply making a walk. Like that's powerful in itself. So, I mean, that's another thing with like, uh, I think uh, ultra running and top athletes um, in different genres. I don't think that walking is too valued. Like in terms of like, eh, maybe I'm wrong, but I I don't see a lot of runners talking about hiking and walking all the time. Um, but for me, I feel like walking, it, I try to incorporate some level of walking, especially when I'm training for like a big race, mm-hmm. like walking in the woods is really fantastic. And I value that. Or walking with a group of friends in the city. We have like a Thursday where I get together with some of my friends that aren't runners and we just do a walk. And it's really nice. Like that was one of my best training buildups to bigs was getting together with my friends who are not runners and like doing the walk with them. Because some of them, uh, my one buddy, Charles, he's a professor, economics, and he's he's been, uh, you know, struggling with some of the health issues over the last few years and uh, trying to get his weight down. And so for him, it was really powerful to be able to get the walk in. And for me, it also was powerful for me because I'd already done all these miles running and getting that walk in was like getting that last pump in like a bench press it was like give me that extra little extra it's like that one percent that that makes an impact Mm. in terms of the training how structured is it you run to and from your school every day uh, and then you're competing in these ultras which are part of the training i assume but is there a program is it periodized do you have a coach what does that look like? Or is it just something that you figure out and go on feel? It's like the Wizard of Oz and that guy behind the scene pulling up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, because honestly, you I don't, don't have, have Chris Houth yeah, like sending you a program telling you what to no do coach. every day. I've never had a coach. You've never in my had a life. coach. Never had you a coach. And Courtney. No, no. And I think in some ways, uh, you know, Courtney and I are very similar in some domains when it comes to training. Like, I don't have. A, a definitive plan for each day. Like I kind of leave it flexible. Mm-hmm. So for example, today I had no plan. I, I just know I want to get out there and, and use the time I have. And so this morning I woke up, uh, kind of both woke up about 4.30 and I was like, oh, you know, well, hey, I'm in this beautiful place. I'm just, honey, I'll be back in a few hours, a couple hours. And I went up the mountain. I didn't know I was going to do like the mountains above Agora Hills this morning. But it was just perfect for like mm. the getting into the Barkley S and being nighttime, dark still, and like uh, getting some like vert in. It was phenomenal, but I didn't have it on my agenda. It's just like trying to work with what I have. However, like I do know week to week, I know like I want to get this many miles or I want to like build this much climbing in. So I have like a, a weekly plan and then I have. With races, I'll have like a pyramid plan in my mind, like that I'll I'll kind of trace it backwards. So I say, okay, like two or three weeks out, I want to be at this point. And then I build it backwards and I say, okay, where am I here? Okay, so I'm going to get from here to that point. What do I have to do to get from here to there? Mm -hmm. And then so I'll just gradually build up the mileage. And I'll also be thinking about like each race, I want to simulate what's happening with the race. So for bigs, it was like, combination of half the time trail, half the time road. So I can't just focus only on one or the other. I have to be strong in both. And also I don't have to be that fast. Like for bigs, it's just about being out there and surviving the longest. So getting used to running at not the fastest time or doing the walking with my friends. Like I'm not doing that right now in my routine, although I wish I could. 
but just tweaking things so that it fits whatever race you're mm -hmm. going after. And that's one of the things I love about ultra running so much is that it has such diversity. There's so many things you can explore. You could go for a really fast race on a track or 50K or road race, or you can go out and like do a stage race in like Mongolia or something. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do. So I've never had any coach, but I have people that are like, uh, have inspired me. Right. Including yourself. No, come on. No, it's true. Uh, but no, there, you, is a, there is a, there a level is. of yeah. intentionality that you're bringing to it. And to your point about the similarities or the shared sensibility that you have with Courtney, you know, I look at the two of you, and I think I maybe talked about this last time you were on, but I see very similar personality types as well. You're both incredibly affable, grounded, humble people who are grateful to, you know, be doing what they're doing and almost seem bewildered by their own success on some level. And I can't help but think like, what is that about? Like what you do and what she does together. I mean, you guys are at the top of the mountain in terms of, you know, human capability and ultra running. But I have to think also that behind the scenes, there's some sort of hidden engine here uh, that I'd like to know a little bit more about. But I think your dispositions are so generous and I think it dispels maybe somebody who doesn't know so much about this world, dispels their preconception that in order to do the kind of things that both of you do, that you have to be this really hardened person who's a take no prisoners type of personality. And you're not that. Like you're a very kind of loving, open, you know, graceful, gentle human being. What is that about? Uh, well, uh, Courtney is much more humble. <laughs> she, she is. She is. I greatly appreciate like the compare, you know, comparing me in any way to Courtney because Courtney is, uh, just the best in the world in so many domains and she's, true she's, and you ran 450 yeah. miles okay so <laughs> keep you. going Thank go you. ahead i think like the basic one of the things about courtney and i is that even if we weren't like winning races or even finishing the first front half of the group i i think we would still be out there enjoying the experience we're both very competitive people but we also, I think that the base energy which we operate is that we just love the whole piece. We love running. We love the people. We love the, the nature. So, I mean, I feel like, and there's a lot of people that have those same energy forces that, that propel them. But I feel like that for us, is not just about being... Uh, the first runner, we're both very competitive and we strive to be the best we can be. But I hope that even someday, you know, hopefully it's many, many years and decades from now, but someday when I'm finishing in the very back, I'll still be out there and enjoying it, you know, uh, having fun with uh, just whatever that endeavor is or venture is. Like, it's just an adventure. So yeah. I think that to me, there's more important things in, in life. Um, it resonates with me. The adventure of it all is something that I is priceless to me. Like there's nothing. So I'm just grateful to have this experience. It's, it's just for the young person that's under my layers that was chunk and goonies. <laughs> yeah. That, that was you know, working for years to get under five hours in the marathon. You know, I never saw myself as a strong runner in middle school or high school. Yeah, I never saw that. I wasn't as uh, disciplined with things. Uh, I, I didn't know that it was even feasible to, to grow into that sort of mode. I guess I took it as like uh, more genetics or that it was just not feasible. Mm. To your point, a lot of people share that sensibility with ultra running, the appreciation of the community, being outdoors, nature, pushing yourself, like all of that stuff is not unique to you nor to no, nor no, no. nor to Courtney. No, no. So no. I guess, you know, the question remains like what is what it? is the differentiator? 
for okay. you? Is it the accumulation of all of these experiences and the level of discipline and intentionality that, that you've kind of brought to this experience incrementally over a long period of time? What is the difference between you running 450 miles and the person who craps out at 300, 250, whatever? Like, what is the secret weapon under the hood if I pop the hood, <laughs> yeah. you know, into Harvey's soul? I'm very driven, like, uh, yeah. with the this running. Is the hidden yeah. thing. It's like behind yeah. the smile yeah, yeah, and the, uh, the affability is, yes. this is what I'm getting yeah, at. I'm there very, has to be some I'm kind of killer driven. instinct yeah. deep I, down I, under there that so, I mean, you I'm try not, to hide I'm from as, everyone? I'm not as, I'm okay. not as Where's the darkness? I'm not as pacific as Courtney. Uh -huh. <laughs> she, is, she, is, she is. There's so, no darkness there. So I tried I tried to find it. I couldn't unearth it. But I am bad. I use my imagination and sort of some wild ways at times. And like, uh, you know, like I, I have like the honey badger spirit animal. Mm -hmm. um, you got a couple spirit Yeah, animals. I have a couple. This race, I was, uh, it was a honey badger. Like the honey badger just never it's stops. It's a choose your adventure it's spirit your adventure. animal. Yeah. Like you, yeah. you swap them out. I do. Yeah, it depends on the environment, but it only happens for like my big A races. So next one would be Barkley. But it's the honey badger, the uh, Mongolian horse, because the Mongolian horse just keeps on going. And I would be like, in the midst of the race, I'd be like, going like that because it relaxes your face it helps relax your shoulders it actually has a it's a technique that the horses use and oh, that's runners, why they do that yeah, yeah well, that's why i think so okay. all <laughs> right i'm making that up maybe, An anecdotal theory that's, but... yeah it's my theory but the runners would be near me and be like harvey what are you doing that like that like uh i'm like that's smart i'm just like relaxing myself you know it's like i'm a mongolian horse yeah and, and courtney has like a, a dragon um like thing, but uh -huh. I'll have to let her tell you that because it might be a secret. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I've never yeah, heard that. Yeah, Ooh, dragon did fire. Did you just divulge yeah, something yeah, that yeah, was? Well, she, uh, could, pretty, no, she could. She could tell you. It's it a technique, but you also have an um, unlikely spirit animal, a third one. Do you know what I'm talking about? The dragon? No, I don't know. no, no, no. Well, the there's monarch, a monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So the first day in Biggs, I actually kind of took on the monarch butterfly because Anthony from Quebec is a friend of mine and he ran from Quebec to Mexico to draw awareness. He's a, he and his wife are attorneys. They took time off from their practice and they wanted to draw awareness about the plight of the monarchs. Because that's their migra migratory, migratory pattern. They fly from Canada to Mexico, all right? All the way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's incredible on a single life cycle to go all the way from Quebec to Mexico. They're trying to get people to plant milkweed. There's like a, a loss of perhaps 90% of the monarchs. And there's also a group that come up here to California too, that there's a, a real loss of these. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I saw a monarch on the first day when I was running. And that was absolutely... Uh, that gave me a little spike of like energy, you know, just like, just to make that connection with my friend Anthony and like monarch butterflies don't seem like the proper spirit animal for this sort of an engagement. Yeah, it's a very counterintuitive yeah, spirit they animal. Because go like this yeah. way for 15 minutes. But what's minutes interesting about it yeah. is that it's this tiny, fragile thing, and yet it can go all the way from Canada to Mexico. So it's defying your expectations, which That's kind of it. plays into this personality type of you being this you know, kind of affable guy who is living your life, who has this capacity that uh, he can unleash at any moment and defy everybody's expectations. That's the magic of it. Mm. And I mean, there are some other things too. So the week before the race, I, I think I went to Whole Foods on uh, Thursday night with Kelly. She came down for a night from Circleville. And anyways, I ran into this old lady um, back by the cereal aisle. And she kind of reminded me of my mother. She had her, this real fancy hat on and she was lonely. I felt like, you know, and I wanted to just strike up a conversation. And I said like, oh, I love your hats and this and that. And then we got to the checkout aisle and this lady happened to be behind me and I was wearing my two times you gear and it has a big X here. And she looked over at me and it's like, you know, the week before Halloween. And she's like, are you an X man? I was like, well, Kind of. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a two X man. Yeah, two X. Yeah. So then in midst the race, I have to be honest, like on the second day, I did have like this sort of uh moment where I just like was envisioning myself as Wolverine. And I'm like, all these other runners, because there's 75 runners, it can be really intimidating that all these people are like very strong and look fast and all the other things. And I'm like, you guys are 
all gone. It's bad of me to say, but yes, I had that moment. Where Why I'm is like, it bad, of you, bad for you to say that? You no, feel like, guilty, like, no, no, well, like I'm just owning like, your space and yeah, planting like, your flag. Yeah, so I'm just like, yeah, everyone, you guys are all, you're, you're, toast. you're, you're in for something coming. <laughs> Yeah, it was bad. The storm so, is coming. Yeah, the storm is coming. Yeah. It was like in nah. the form of Wolverine. In Wolverine, I'm like, yeah, in the terms of running. <laughs> like, I'm just going to run you two down. There is an interesting psychological thing about the alter ego. Like, when you step out of the frame of who you think you are and you step into the, you know, exoskeleton of a superhero, there is an energy boost with that. Like, it is a common yeah. thing, whether conscious or otherwise, that, you know, tons of high performers do. I mean, there's a difference between David Goggins and Goggins, you know, or Mark Cavendish and Cav or James Lawrence and the Iron Cowboy. There's a million examples. And I think there's something very intentional about having that moniker or that archetype that creates like another gear for a performance that the Harvey might not be capable of, but the Wolverine or the Monarch yeah. Butterfly or the Honey Badger uh, or the <laughs> Mongolian days, Horse, you, you know, use might like be every able to, single tool yeah. in the toolbox. Right. Yeah. So it is a wild thing because when I'm in my classroom, I mean, I'm I'm trying and I'm I, I give my full effort, but there are days where I'm like, I want to step into my character that comes after four days. You know, it's like I build into this different being of myself at times. Whereas like I'm very calm and subdued and relaxed. And then, but there are times where I was out there on like the fourth day and I don't know who else was running near me. I wasn't cussing at them, but I had like a soundtrack that sounded like David Goggins like a bit. So I get into like different modes. It wasn't complaining. It was just like psyching myself up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just getting myself psyched up. It is an interesting thing. I think using your, your power of your imagination and creativity and like when i didn't put myself in that wolverine character like every day it was like that second day and i sort of smiled like and laughed about it and it just actually like was entertaining to me it was like mm. just kind of fun and it also kind of propelled me later that night i probably felt maybe i was really tired like on the second night that was one of my my tougher points and i like said to my buddy Randy, because you're only allowed to have one crew member there, but my buddy Judd was doing a DJ event in Indiana. So we were allowed to have uh, my crew trade on the third day. He's like, I love you, Harvey, yeah. but I'm out of here. I got to go spin some yeah. records. Yeah, he's like, yeah. well, my one friend Randy had to go to a dentist appointment. My other friend Judd, he had to come from like doing that. But Judd is an amazing crew person. I always say like with these events, the crew is like quintessential in so many ways. With Randy, he also like was able to say something powerful. So like the second night, it might have been like, maybe it was even the third, start of the third day. It was a simple point he said. He's like, uh, one of your team members, uh, Kevin, he was on the USA team the year before and he was also running a race. He's like the film crew asked him who they thought would be the last person to survive. And Kevin's like, you know, without a doubt, Harvey. And so my, my other buddy told me this it caused some sort of physiological change even in me. Like I felt like that fatigue and, and tension I was feeling like that was going through my back and I was just feeling really tired and a little bit stiff. It was like that just went away. And I felt this like new energy. And I was like, want to like live up to that expectation there. And like, also it felt really good that Kevin said that. Like, it was really such an incredible compliment for mm -hmm. him to say something like that about me. Cause I was, my mind was always teetering on like losing that faith. And I was always trying to keep that, that dream of being the last person going the, the furthest cemented together. But there were many times where I had to really fight to keep it from crossing over the other boundary. You know, keep that, that positive mindset that it's still doable. When I'm going for three days without sleep and I'm feeling more tired than the previous year and it's like, but then by the time I got to the fourth night, it seemed like I got to that frequency where I was so 
uh, hell bent on like being the final person, I like lost a sense of like fatigue to a degree. Like I, those things became less visible to me. Like my brain was so hyper laser focused on being the final outcome that all the other things just didn't matter anymore. I was like, you transcended yeah, fatigue. I transcended You're in a different fatigue. state of consciousness. It was a different where, state. Like I, I went through so a metamorphosis where it just left me. I was like, I was fighting it. Like it was like when I was in with Jesse in the cold plunge after doing the hot sauna. And I got in that cold plunge. I'm not the best at the cold plunge yet. <laughs> like I'm in there for 20 seconds uh-huh. and I'm like just <laughs> like this. And, and Jesse's like, just relax into it. Just relax into it. Relax your breathing. And I mean, I only made it like 30 some seconds or whatever, but um, the whole experience you kind of transcended over to bigs with like you get to a point where you relax into it Mm. and then it's like you're anticipating like the punch coming but once the punches have come you're just like well i fuck it i don't care about any of these punches anymore you can hit me another hundred times i'm not gonna stop so it just pulls you and that that's where it, it really attracts me to this because i i can't get to that sort of place and running a marathon or running a hundred mile race, this takes you to a whole nother place I've ever seen before. Yeah, that's so wild. Uh, yeah, it's it's something that can't even be described in words. Like it's so experiential. It's like trying to explain to somebody what your ayahuasca trip was like, right? <laughs> like you are a psychonaut in that regard. Like it is as much, if not more, a venture into the beyond of, you know, the brain's capacity and the relationship between consciousness and physical activity, like in a new and different way that isn't just about the typical conversation around like, walk me through your mantras when you reach Mm. that point where you can't keep going. Mm. Like this is the PhD version of that, where you're almost on a different plane and a different relationship with your own body and level of self-awareness because the fatigue is so profound. It's like a point of opportunity to like, I feel like there's some sort of, uh, there's a enlightenment that does come from like this, this period and like uh, exploring those spaces of the human mind. So what are you returning to report back to us mere mortals about <laughs> no, you know, what you learned from that, you know? Yeah. It's, what is this it's, doing like, for it's you? It's part of our Barbie. DNA. Like I feel yeah. like, you know, as humans, we are driven to the unknown. There is a point of death. <laughs> so, I mean, things are not, you cannot infinitely go forever. But in, in a human evolution and in, in our, our time on this planet, humans have experienced those points before. I mean, you look at, like feats of survival, uh, the six days, the man trapped under the rock. I've lost his name right at the moment, but- Oh, the he, one they made the movie about? Yeah, he had yeah. to basically break his arm off? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just an incredible story. Or or someone lost at sea for weeks. I mean, it's like, uh, those are far more remarkable, but it's like pushing to that same, uh, that we have more in us than we realize. And like the very interesting thing was like after the race, I sat down, we had like a little celebration and I did some chat on like with the live feed. And then I walked um, over to the like tent with my my buddy Judd and another friend next to me. And I mean, I walked, but I was relying on them a bit too. Like, I mean, I was definitely like, and my body was like, yeah, we're done. We're done. This is it. Um, but the, the thing that's wild is that my mind, I really believe I could have just run through that whole night. And I think that it's possible that maybe we could have kept going through the, into the next day. And then how far beyond that, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But in terms of my body, my body was just cooperating. Like at that point, my body surrendered to my mind. My body just gave up and it said, I'm, I'm tired of <laughs> resisting this brain, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it says, we're going to go. We're just going to go as far as we have to. And there's no debate about it. We're just doing it. But the minute the race is over and you're like, I'm done, everything then the, shuts down. Then it down. goes back yeah. to the, the body yeah. gets majority control. Right. And then it's like, no, we're going to lay down. Then we're going to take our time. We're going to go to the restroom over there. We're going to take one minute to walk to that restroom. <laughs> 
on the subject of higher planes of consciousness and and the kind of transcendent aspect of this, it feels like a natural race for you to pursue would be the 3100. <laughs> Is that on the list? Did we talk about that last time? Maybe no, we did. I can't remember. Have, actually, have you ever had a guest on from that? Race? Uh, no. Well, I had Sanjay Rawal on, who made the documentary okay. about it. Nice. And I know people who have competed in it. It's not a backyard format, but it's right. not dissimilar. It's yeah. like a stage race. You have certain hours where you can run, and you just run around the city block. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's only a mile loop, right? And how do you say the name again? It's Church It's the uh, Sri Shinmoy. Sri Shinmoy. Yeah. yeah, because I think that he is a fascinating character. I mean, he pulled airplanes by himself. Oh, I didn't he, know about this. Yeah, like he's the one that developed that race. Uh, he's since passed away. Yeah, but he's uh, like but, the patron saint of running, especially in New York City. He yeah. He's had a major impact on running culture dating back to, you know, the early 70s, I that's think. That's really interesting. Um, like, as back a sort to of like, spiritual leader. And who's the guy, the New York Ted Corbett. Roadrunners? Well, there was Ted. And then who's the guy who ran the New York City Marathon in like the 70s and 80s? I can't remember his name. Mm. But I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe he was heavily influenced by Sri Shinmoy. And there's such a strong yeah. running culture in New York yeah. City. And I think you can't understand the origin of that culture without understanding Sri Shinmoy, who yeah. is like this yeah. spiritual guru right. who had this philosophy that running was a path to transcendence, that's, uh, the ascetic that. nature of running. And that's the origin of this race, the 3100, where you run around the city block in Queens, totally nondescript, like not urban, but not suburban kind of city, you know, layout until somebody gets to 3100 miles. Right. And, right. and hopefully self-transcends in the process of that, all right? So <laughs> right. this has to be on your bucket list. Yeah, it would be. It's uh, it's in the summertime, so it's almost possible to do with my teaching schedule. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I did learn from like the Appalachian Trail that when you do a really long adventure like that, even with my like methodical way of like eating plant-based foods, movement, hot and cold treatment, it's... It's difficult to bounce your body back in like six months. It takes maybe six months or eight months. So it would take some time. But I, I'm I love the you know the exploring that that does sound like it could be mm -hmm. it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time commitment. <laughs> so, For sure. I mean yeah, it's so basically would, like your whole yeah, summer. It's my right? whole or your summer. fall. It's I think I was I was in New York City. I think it was October, and it was going on while I was right. there. So it goes yeah. into the fall. That would cut in. Yeah, I mean you're. It, it's tough. You know, very committed right. to not missing a day of teaching. Well, I, I do miss days, and I think that everyone in my school is very, like the rest of the staff are probably like, oh, Harvey, why you? How yeah, you get to take all these times off? Yeah. But I take it unpaid leave, and fortunately, like I do get the time off. But I usually uh, take maybe two weeks to do races in a year. That race is like also uh, involves, I would feel like I like having crew members also for these big events. Mm -hmm. And that would be a major commitment to be away from Kelly and, yeah. uh, or to have, I don't think she's going to want to come longer in like a few days or a week, maybe <laughs> to that guy for race. But you it, know, she could, she could shack up at a nice hotel right. in Manhattan and that, pop in every couple days, bad, just make right? sure you're still alive. Yeah. There's actually right now I have on my, uh, Instagram under stories, the opportunity to vote for one of my races for 2024. And like going back to 2017, when I did bigs for the first time, the reason I decided to do bigs is I put four different races out there. I had like a six day race, a stage race in Oman. Maybe it was like Leadville and also bigs. And bigs won like with 80% of the vote. Mm. So that's why I did that race the first time. I would have never discovered it had like people right. not vote Here's for what's going to happen. You're going to do this again and yeah. I'm going to campaign. I'm going to lobby for the 3100 uh -oh. and then uh -oh. you're in big trouble. Yeah, because then I'm you're in big have to trouble. It, right? But yeah. let me ask you this. So you have a full-time job teaching. We talked about that at length last time. And ultra running is also a full-time job. I don't think it would be fair to call it a part-time gig. Like you're very serious about this, obviously. You're at the pinnacle of your career and performing you know, at the highest elite level, but your life is full. 
And I'm interested in how these two worlds nourish each other because I would have to assume that if a brand came to you, I don't know, you know, shoe brand or an apparel brand and said, Harvey, we just, you're the best. We love you. We think that you are the the hero that we need and the ambassador that we want on our roster. And we're going to write you this enormous check and we want you to just run. Would you take that deal if that meant that you had to retire from teaching? Well, I have this amazing shoe company already behind yeah, me with Newton. Newtons. Honestly, I am so, so loyal to them. I've already been offered something that maybe exceeds that by quite a long distance, but I've been with Newton for over a decade. And like, I truly Let's say it's a non-competing shoes. brand. I know <laughs> okay, you love yeah, Newton. It's yeah, great. So and I want so, you to, you like, know, you know, it's $100,000. Let's definitely that. love on Newton but, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And let's yeah, say it's yeah. a food brand oh, or food. Whole Foods oh, yeah. comes yeah. to you and oh, says, yeah. we're Amazon. We're yeah, gonna, yeah. Just That's name a, your number, right, Harvey. Right, right. Would I do we that? We know you like that Ferrari. You can have that too. Well, honestly, I would probably be open to doing that for like a leave of absence. So like for a year or maybe mm-hmm. for a few years. But then again, like after I, I, I really love the teaching aspect. So if I, if I went that direction, I did that, then I would want to also be doing something like relatable to youth as well. So then I would have to like uh, start a program like Ray up in um, Quebec. Uh, uh-huh. He's a hop. Uh, he oh, has a hop. Yeah. Yeah. Ray, he has like a really neat, neat uh, adventure. He takes kids uh, several times a year to like these remote places on the planet. And then they, they broadcast what's happening for like lesson plans with like Canadian national geographic. And it's like, then he's into the classroom. So he's impacting more than just a single classroom. He's impacting classrooms all over. So if I had a, a dream, like I would absolutely, absolutely love to be able to impact more kids and be in more classrooms that's where I, I would be. Oh, I'd see the opportunity with mm-hmm. that. But with my school, SCPA, it's a it's a really amazing place. It's a very diverse, like uh, art school, like what your children mm-hmm. have, and it's hard to replace that. But if I were to get, have an opportunity where I could do something in that respect of like, you could scale the impact, a, scale it to a larger that you're larger having group, on young people. That I, I would 100 yeah. percent be in, or or if I could do like a sort of running travel. TV show or yeah. something. What's the status uh, of that? Because I know, uh, you, I know you, you've, <laughs> you've, you're trying to make this happen. We got right? to talk to Kelly on that. She's, okay. she's kind of helping. I want to bring Kelly on, but I have one more thing I want to uh, talk to you about before we do that, which is the why behind all of this. I'm sure this is another question people ask you. Why do you do this? What are you getting out of this? Why do you have to run so far? And I just know in the course of kind of sharing your story and the stories of other people who are on the outer edges of, you know, this world that amidst the celebratory, you know, kind of response that you get, there's also some pushback from people who are like, why are you sharing this? This is unhealthy. This isn't good for anybody. Like these people must have some kind of psychological problem. <laughs> like why, you know, like like there are better people to celebrate. There's something not right about this and maybe you shouldn't be promoting it, right? Right, I'm right, sure right. You, you get a little oh, bit yeah, of that yeah, coming there's, your way. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. So what's the why and, you know, what is really driving this behind all of it? Yeah, I mean- is it Maslow that has the hierarchy of human needs? Yes. Like sort of paralleling that. Like, I mean, I feel like there's a hierarchy there. So, I mean, at the base level, it's like there's like a physical element to it, like a, a chemistry, like a dopamine impact, you know, like from like running, what running brings you positive health and brings like positive, like, mm-hmm. you know, feelings both while I'm doing it as well as like, in the afternoon when I'm like reflecting back on that experience. But then there's like the social aspect. Like, I mean, I've met uh, people that have overcome numerous life challenges because of running. And it's like, part of that is also that social dynamic, like what they get from like being a part of something. So there's that social dynamic that's large And then you get the sort of like elation that comes from like beating yourself, like to to push yourself to another level Mm -hmm. and to uh, continuously be 
even when you're in your your 60s, your 70s, or like my friend Mike Fremont, who's 102 in February. Right. Friend uh, of the pod. There's still kicking. Still kicking. Out there, yeah. getting it done. He does pull-ups every night on his way to bed. <laughs> It's Unreal. like, and he, he wears your shoes. Not my shoes, yeah, on. Yeah, he, wear, yeah, he likes, he wears, he wears he likes his ons. Yeah, he wears his yeah. ons and he, he collects the little pebbles. Uh, he's got a little like a uh, jar that's about this big of like the pebbles he's collected from the shoe. That <laughs> so gets stuck in the sole, yeah. He, he likes to bring it back to the <laughs> shoe store and like Amazing. give them back. But it is like uh, a love. Um, there's like um, a spiritual element to it as well. Like once I recognize like the highest points, it's like, I feel like a closeness with the energy of the universe. I don't know what to say. I can't really describe it, but I feel that like power sometimes when I'm like in a, an event like bad water out in the middle of the desert and I can see, you know, for as far as human can, I can see and I just like take my body and just, it feels so primal to be moving across that landscape and doing things that, my younger self was thought was like absolutely insane. <laughs> so that's something. But then there's also at the very high level, there's also like this giving back. So like this year, we actually teamed up with the Brighton Center mm -hmm. and like we didn't finalize everything. That was another thing I was working on the last eight days that before the race. That came together at the last minute. The last eight it? days before the race. Yeah. I was like, we had been talking about it, but we didn't finalize the details. And we we're going to aim to raise a hundred thousand dollars, which was far ten times more than I've ever raised for any group. Uh, I got to speak to the people working on the ground. This organization helps like over twenty thousand people in northern Kentucky, greater Cincinnati. It's like family planning, right? It's everything. They have shelters. They have like uh, food banks. They have like help people get their first houses to overcome like addiction. There's all, all different like facets to this organization, but they're nonprofits. And so it was at that point, it was also an, another drive, like knowing like when I had my friend Tracy Outlaw, who does all my social media, like in these races and is a really good storyteller, but he, he was relaying to me that we were up over $15,000 and way over 20,000. And that gave me more motivation as well. So, I mean, we end up raising now over $44,000. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like knowing that yeah, that was connecting with other people and, and knowing that we were impacting other people, it impacted me. And like that, that was also like motivation in it. And also like, I really love to like, influence our culture around health. In, in Ohio, we're not uh, really at the same level of California. Uh, we have even you know, higher obesity rates. I uh, feel like there's fewer options for healthier foods, especially in rural areas like Circleville, where Kelly and I live. Mm -hmm. I live half my time in Circleville. And so I kind of like, honestly, like when I'm running to work and back home from work and I'm racing the buses, I kind of consider myself like a human billboard. <laughs> so it's like trying to get people to move beyond like, uh, you know, what they can do to, to, you know, take the people that, that are more sedentary and get them out and like walking. I mean, I try to do that with my students. That is something that I, I try to do. I try to encourage people to eat more whole food, plant-based foods, you know, even if they're not going to like, you know, become vegetarian or vegan, like, I mean, if they're incorporating more of that into their nutrition, you know, my mom had a stroke when she was like 54 and she almost died. And as a result of it, it, it impacted her speech and her mobility for the rest of her life. And fortunately, she is still alive at 84. But for 30 years, it's been a, a different experience. Mm -hmm. Like she, you know, she does not have the same uh, abilities and it's very frustrating for her. So, I mean, much of what happened to her at 54 could have possibly been different had she been eating differently and had she been, uh, had a routine and had less stress in her life. You know, those, those things, absolutely, I don't believe she would have had the stroke. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, DNA does play a role and it does impact us, but we can also fight back. And like, we can also, you know, I have an end date as well, but it's like the quality of life. Like, I mean, 
my buddy 102, Mike Fremont, he's still doing pull-ups at 102. I mean, that's remarkable. How many people can do it? A pull up, I mean, oh, across the whole population. Yeah, it's, it's, that and guy's it's, unbelievable. Yeah, he went up 102. All the, 102. I mean, he came to my classroom, he walked up all four flights of stairs. I mean, and like, it's, uh, there are a lot of people who come into the school that don't do that. They are 20 and 30 years of age. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, to me, like, I'm only one person, you're one person. We have a whole bunch of people out here in ultra running and like different like activities like this. But I feel like if I can influence uh, a few people or more people, I would that would be the best thing in my world. Like, you know, just to have more influence and in getting people that higher quality of life. So it's not an inconvenience. <laughs> it's, a, it's far from that. All right. Answer complete. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's the I'm, end of I'm your sorry. answer. I'm sorry. I gave no, you a I, I, I'm gonna, long, long no, I want to hear you. I want to hear you out. Right. And... You can get Kelly up here well, to hear the honest right. truth of it. Trust me. <laughs> she, she, she Trust me. Much All right. Trade. That's coming. She's coming in hot in a minute. But before we get to her, I'm not going to let you off the hook on this. If I heard you correctly, your answer to the question of why you do what you do and push yourself in this very specific way is because of the community social aspect of it, your love of nature, this feeling that you get from pushing yourself and kind of suffering and, you know, the kind of downstream impact that that has on your life, the spiritual uh, piece to it. Then we have the fundraising piece. And then there's this role that you can play in terms of influencing the health of others, all very laudable wise. And yet (laughs) I'm feeling... (laughs) I'm feeling like you didn't, we're not quite there in in terms of getting to the bottom of this. I think that all of these goals could be pursued short of running 450 miles and not sleeping for days on end. You could go to the turkey trot and maybe run the New York City Marathon every other year and still raise money, enjoy the social peace, get out in nature, have a, you know, a spiritual experience and, and, and the like. If I was going to create my own Maslow's hierarchy of these whys, I think I would put, in terms of like your pure honesty in answering this question, I would put the spiritual piece (laughs) and the suffering piece at the top here because those are the two that I think might be inching a little bit closer to the answer of why you go as long and as hard as you do because – all of these other goals can be achieved short of you practicing five minute naps in between classes and you know spending every commute for the last 10 and a half years running to and from school. All of the like it's very extreme, right? Admittedly. I get it, bro. I love you. But to the person who is the person who's posting, like, I don't understand this, like this is like, let's go a little bit deeper here. Let's get into the darkness. Like, what's the real push? Like what is what is the engine that gets you through that third day and into the fourth day and into four and a half days without sleep and is continuing to propel you beyond your enjoyment of nature and it's cool to hang out with some other people when you're running around in the woods. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I just and I'm not saying you have to. to like, yeah, I, I, I'm I, not I think, saying you have to know right. the answer it's, to that. It's a, it's a, yeah, yeah. You're so good with like diving in and peeling back the layers. You did that last time. Actually, I had a couple, at least one epiphany in the last time we met that was something I didn't even quite get until we I left that space. But uh, I want to just go as far as humanly possible, and I have this aching desire to want to always go further and to push myself into like some zone that doesn't make sense. But I don't know, you may have to get Kelly up. (laughs) She may may give a better answer. And let's do that. But I I will offer this and I think, and please correct me if this is at all off base. I think there's something inside of you that owns and knows that you're very good at this. Like, it's not the normal person who, you know, a couple of days into this decides like who looks around at the other competitors and says, yeah, these people, they're not going to beat me like and just knows it. And maybe that's Wolverine, but that's also Harvey. <laughs> and so I think you know that you have this in you and you know it's special. 
And there's something really beautiful about honoring that. And that's okay, you know? And it is exciting to see if you can go further than anyone else and to explore the outer edges of what happens to your body and your mind when you go further than anybody else ever has. I'm still exploring it. <laughs> it's yeah. still like, I just, I, I think you're right. You've said things that, that's, that are true. Like that you're absolutely right. Mm. And there's, there's more layers to it. But I'm also, also sort of multifaceted in a sense that I may be feeling one area. Like at some time I might be having that hunting phase where I'm like lured myself in the back and I'm just observing every every single possible detail of every person at like a level that no one realizes is happening. Mm -hmm. And then there's other times where I'm just in there and enjoying like a great conversation and like we're totally working as a team. Like the the third night, there was like seven of us that ran many of the loops to finish as a unit at 300 miles. And like for me, running as that unit um, brought me such uh, incredible it's gratitude. Cool. Yeah, like it's it was a pretty so, cool. That's a pretty cool thing. It was cool so thing. cool because yeah. uh, there were some of these runners that were like, they were on their way out. But because we like worked as a team and like I called the the go, when to go and when to slow. Like I, so like we would like run to a certain point and I said, okay, now we're going to like walk for like 20 seconds, mm -hmm. relax yourself. You guys are doing, I just say, you guys are doing amazing. Keep moving. Okay. We're going to get this. And I said, okay, uh, we're going to start running again when we run. And I was just like speaking to the group most of the time and like just calling it out to me that was fun it was like being like a commander mm -hmm. of a group <laughs> but as myself every single person there added energy to me it was like animals moving in nature like i mean animals moving in nature move more efficiently than in individuals so like there was a strategic element to that as well i wasn't thinking of like you know taking out the person next to me i was thinking of all of us are moving further together yeah and we're like actually working as a unit and this is freaking amazing that we get to 300 miles you know three years earlier no one had even made it to 300 miles now we we had 22 people make it to 300 miles and seven of them were in our group that's, so that's it was so cool that was probably one of my favorite experiences of the whole race was running in that unit yeah yeah that is cool it was fun it all right was really let's cool. get the truth let's all get, right, let's right. get <laughs> kelly up here and uh we're gonna put all your bullshit to the test there you go all hey, right. let me Kelly, welcome. Thank you. Thanks it's for joining us. It's an honor us. to be here. Have you ever done a podcast before? No, not like this. All right. Well, welcome. <laughs> uh, let all of this like disappear. Nice little surprise. Um, I'm delighted to have you here. Let's just begin with, uh, if, you, if you're giving Harvey uh, a report card on the veracity of what he shared, like what's the, <laughs> how's he doing? What do we not know? What, what hasn't come up? What, who's the real Harvey here? I would have to give him a C plus. C plus, dude. What? Scathing. I thought it was like at least A minus or something. <laughs> Maybe B minus. Maybe B minus. It was, oh, no, he's, I think he's still figuring himself out a lot. So when he kind of, I feel like dances around questions sometimes, and you do a very good job at bringing him back to the original question. I think a lot of it is he is still searching for what's inside of him. Um, there's also a reason why I'm still with Harvey after over 10 <laughs> yeah. years. Well, I want to um, understand this. You guys have a unique relationship. We and do. I'm still trying to figure him out, I guess, is what I'm saying too. <laughs> and I think that's one of the biggest attractions is I learn something new about him almost <laughs> Daily. So if you had to answer the why question, or if somebody asks you, like, why does Harvey do this? Like, what is, what's beneath the surface here? I would say that when he talks about wanting to make a difference in other people's life, I would say that is pretty much the number one reason. I can see that. It truly, truly is. I've never met anybody, and he's never said this. I'm just saying this from what I take from him. I, I seriously think... He just wants to leave this world a better place. And anything he can do to bring more goodness, um, positivity, um, if he can help others discover what they're capable of doing, that's his life goal. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what he wants to do. 
and certainly running further and longer than anyone else. It's just as good a way as any other. <laughs> it's a good place to, do to that. start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's the only stage I got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the card you're playing. Right. Right. It's a good card. Yeah. And, you know, I think uh, you are correct when you say that he's this, like, lovable, you know, kind human. Um, me and my daughter joke, we always say we're going to get a bumper sticker made that says, I break for lightning bugs because we have gotten whiplash before when, <laughs> because we've been driving on a back road and uh -huh. a lightning bug flies in our path and he's got to break really yeah. hard. So we don't... No, I don't do that all the time now. <laughs> yeah. The Harvey that people see is they see runner Harvey and school teacher Harvey, people don't get to see Harvey as my partner, which is, I mean, it's who he is, but it's like a whole other piece that nobody gets to see. Mm. And what is that like? I mean, you, I mean, you're an ultra runner yourself, right? So mm -hmm. you understand this lifestyle and you're engaged with it just the same. And you have this unique relationship because you don't necessarily live together all the time. Right. Yeah, so we've been together for over 10 years. We don't live together. We live about an hour and 45 minutes apart. And I can honestly say that Harvey's training has never impeded our relationship, which is huge. Is that because you're training with him or because, no, he's, because so he's so conscious accommodating. of making he's so sure that conscious of, And when he, says, when he says he doesn't have a plan when he gets up for like what he's going to do that day, he's He's serious. That is where we differ in training because I am more, okay, Monday I've got to run this many miles and I've got to run at this pace. And Harvey is more like, okay, so I'm feeling like 20 feels good today, but I'm going to do my 20 here, here, and here so it doesn't affect any of our plans for the day. Uh -huh. I don't feel like training has ever impeded um, us. And in, in the 10 years that we've been together, he drives to Circleville every weekend. And in over 10 years, never once, never one time has he said, Kelly, I'm really busy this weekend and I've got a lot of stuff to do and I'm not going to make it up to Circleville. Mm -hmm. That is huge. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That's, and what? That's yeah. So those it's, are hey, so my heart, warmed, my heart is warm. My heart is warm. In yeah. fairness, Monday through Friday, this guy can is like running all the time <laughs> and like teaching, and that's pretty much it, right? I imagine yeah. it's fairly monastic during the week for you. Yeah. So I kind of really consider it as like I I one hundred percent live in two different places. I live with you, you know, three nights a week, and mm -hmm. and in Cincinnati four nights a week. And uh, so, yeah, like uh, for the last like five or so years, I've been really involved with also taking care of my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be a couple nights a week uh, in Cincinnati. And we just moved her to Maryland to be near my sister. But otherwise, my teaching day and I do a lot of like running related stuff. You're right. Monday through Thursday. Every other thing, like friends and stuff like that. And that's but, another uh, thing that people don't see of you is that up until just October, two days a week, you were driving 40 minutes round trip to go care for your mm -hmm. mother and not just stop in. Hey, mom, how are you? Um, mom, let's get up and let's go for a walk. Let's go to the store. Let's go out to eat. Let's socialize. Um, so two days a week, you also were doing that. Yeah, it was busy. <laughs> busy so <time. laughs> basically... I need to abandon this quest that I'm on to like uncover the darkness here. Like there, this none. is like uh, uh, Harvey is as you see him, right? Yeah. Like and more, which is oh, you know so, I have hope for nice. humanity. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Thank you for that. Funny. I yeah. do. Oh, I oh, truly yeah. do. Yeah. I I really I feel like he is everything that everybody sees and so much more. Thank you. That's yeah. very sweet. Well, um, we were going for the record for longest engagement, uh -huh. but we actually like have put a date on on our our wedding day now. It's like, oh wow, uh, June first. Like yeah, so we're actually getting married. Um, but we've really been like practically we've been married yeah, like, like the last ten, 10 years. years. Yeah, yeah, we, what we, took we've you been so long. I know, right? <laughs> You're just turning uh, the engagement just, into right, its own just, ultra. Take our time. <laughs> uh -huh. But uh, we actually met in the North Coast 24 hour race. We met in a 24 hour race and. Kelly is always uh, very supportive of me. So I, I couldn't do the types of things I do without her like encouragement, like being on on my team, even if she's not there. Mm -hmm. You know, she may think that some of my ideas are a little delusional at times, perhaps, but it's, but she always has supported me. So, you know, like when I was doing that Big's Backyard, another thing that gave me like umph, you know, I mentioned some of the things already, but like, 
Judd is like telling me, hey, Kelly and Carly, our rescue dog, are out running this morning. And just by the fact that they're out running, you know, and I'm on my fourth day, like I could like kind of connect with that energy. It just, it definitely made me feel better. It just made me feel like, you know, they, well, we're both running in different places in the country, but we're both like, it's a connective energy, mm-hmm. which is really nice. And what's your relationship to ultras and racing these days? Like, what does that um, look like? I have been running ultras for, let's see, I think my first one was in 2011. Yeah. That sounded about right. And I think we met in 2013. Yeah. So I've done uh, 24-hour races, 100-mile races. Mm -hmm. I ran Badwater in 2022. You had a remarkable experience with Badwater because it was like just making it each cut off by like literally a minute. By seconds. Like seconds in some Ooh. places. <laughs> and I mean, she hallucinated. She had like every reason was there to like have quit multiple times. Yeah. But I and did like have you had an this phenomenal crew. crew. Phenomenal. And it's something about Kelly also is like her training doesn't necessarily always come together. But for whatever reason, she is a very strong with executing the race mm. it's like some people they train really really amazing and get all together and then like they get to the race and it just doesn't happen I'm it's opposite. like she's the opposite <laughs> like she, her training <laughs> could just be raveled and like i mean before oh my god and i'm like wow and it's not necessarily like it, maybe some injury happens or this or that but then you get to the race and you are just like a machine. You're like, I'm going to finish. I know. And then I'm yeah. always like, wow, what? I wonder how I would do if I could actually like have a solid training block. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so interesting. Uh, yeah, the person who's so regimented about their training, though, tend to be the people who are less resilient when things go wrong in the middle of a race, right? Because it's a control thing. Yeah, and sometimes. to have the wherewithal to go into a race knowing that your training wasn't great and Mm -hmm. still execute is illustrative of somebody Mm -hmm. who has a tremendous amount of resilience. Mm -hmm. And you touched on- Badwater's no no joke. No joke. No joke. I mean, I seriously, and I had been out there for years prior to me even applying and running. So I knew what I was getting myself into. But then there was this small part of me that thought, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe it really, the hype of the heat and, you know, just all of it, maybe it's not that bad. Oh, my gosh. No, it's terrible. (laughs) The whole thing is terrible. It was so hard. It was so hard. And I have experience with ultras. And the biggest thing that threw me for such a loop out there was the depth perception. So you would run for hours and hours and hours and the mountains would never they don't get, get closer, closer. <laughs> or this little line that goes through oh, this yeah. mountain over to the side is still there 20 miles later i look over oh my goodness there's that line uh, so the depth perception is the one thing that really threw me for a loop yeah. panamint coming off of towns pass you see panamint in the distance oh and yeah it's, it's like <laughs> It takes forever to get yeah. to it. <laughs> well, good for you. I want to talk about the Squid Game thing, but before we transition to that, just so we're clear, nothing else about Harvey that like we need to know that the that the oh, you know that the, the passerby <laughs> wouldn't I understand see, or 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 any eyes. any Let's fast go. ones that that he pulled in the middle of the interview where you felt like that's no come on Harvey. Yeah. It's okay, honey. You I, yeah, right? I'm thinking. I, I was making. Plus. I was making so many <laughs> mental notes when oh, I was okay. listening. I do like. Oh, what did Rich say? He said something, and I'm like thinking. Okay, Harvey, come on now. And I, and you never. I can't remember what it was though. <laughs> yeah, maybe um, it shoot. Yeah, maybe it'll come to me in a minute. But um, yeah, I gave him a C plus, a B minus, somewhere between there because I, I think you're still figuring things out as well. And what what drives me? What to, drives you? I'm still trying to figure out what drives. So you. were you surprised when I won that race, the 450 miles? Like good when, question. Like when That's you were good. watching this from okay, afar. Okay, hold on. This is coming back okay. now. This is coming back okay, now. Okay. So Rich said to you, and I, if you remember correctly, right when we were having lunch prior to coming here, I asked you the exact same question. Mm. I said, but those other people that are out in the race, 
they also think they're going to win. They're also going for the win. You're also going for the win. What makes you different? And you ask that. You said, what differentiates you from the others? Mm -hmm. You know, they could be looking all around saying, oh, I'm taking you all down. You you're all done. And you're looking at everybody as the Wolverine and you're taking everybody down. So what makes you different? And I asked you that exact same question before we came here. And you still, you cannot. That was on like day two, the Wolverine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, uh, a lot of people ask me about Harvey's training. That's what, that's what people typically want to know about. You know, how many miles does he run a week? How often does he do hills? What's his speed work like? I can't answer any of that. And he probably can't either because. No, I, <laughs> that's, um, yeah, it's interesting and refreshing, you know, especially on social media. It's all about what's your morning routine and, yeah. you know, exactly what is your zone to. And all these yes. people get really obsessed with the minutia of the lifestyle habits of high performing people. But in my experience, a lot, not all, but a lot of the most elite people in their respective disciplines and fields have a very different relationship with those kinds of things. It's yes. much more intuitive in nature and not regimented in the way that one might be led to believe if you're yeah. watching a lot of reels on Instagram, right. uh, you know, from people who are not elite telling you what they learned or what you should do or should not do with respect to certain things. And uh, I think there's, I don't know what the lesson in that is, but I think there is a lesson in yeah, that. Yeah, and I think it's your mind and it's your psychology uh, that I think separates him from others. Well, Laz said it. You're the guy who won't give up. So I think it's more honey badger than monarch uh, <laughs> on some level. Like it it's is. that, you know, like not a, a death grip has a pejorative kind of connotation, but like you're latching onto something and you have the tenacity to not let go until you achieve your desired outcome. I think something else about you that a lot of people may not know is that for as long as I've known you, he may have ha he may have a goal going into a race, whether it's like a distance or a time goal. I've never seen him disappointed. I've never seen him upset over like, oh, if I would have just done that, I could have, I could have gotten this time. Or if I would have just done that, I could have maybe, you know, been in second place, then third place. He celebrates every single thing he does, everything. If he doesn't hit a goal in a race, I don't think he looks at it as a failure. I think he looks at it as, you know, moving forward. If I want to do something different, I, I can just tweak something but every finish is a celebration to him would you say that's right yeah i think it, for the most part i mean it's uh i try to find like some positive in everything uh, and then yeah but also like if i don't do as well as i want to that's actually can be really powerful as well so for example like with australia i like finished third and like things fell apart in a way like you know with the going through the deep hallucinations and it was powerful because it caused me to want to grow. Mm -hmm. So like after that, I actually changed some things. Some things real small. Like I started taking cold showers. The whole month leading up to Bakes, I did cold showers. And I'm still doing them now, like only cold showers. Tell the truth about cold showers. What, what's the truth, honey? The truth is you only take a cold shower on the days you don't take hot baths. Yeah, that's true. So okay. I do take, I do take hot baths. Okay. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> right. I'm like, you get me. So yeah. there we go. We got to get checks and balances yeah, here. This is what I was looking right, for. Right. All right. I'm keep like, going. But, <laughs> it's, but, you know, it's it's like the that actually motivated me to elevate like the, you know, different things within my training, like uh mileage a bit more like thinking through what did I mess up with in terms of like maybe my nutrition or like uh, my motivation, my mind, where my mind traveled to, my pacing, all the strategies. Like I thought those through mm -hmm. finishing third in Australia and I set an American record doing that, I like mm -hmm. finished with 375 miles. So I was like, you know, I was grateful that I got that. And I was also grateful to see Phil Gore get the new record because I felt like I was a part of that. So even though I finished third, I was delighted that Phil like overcame and got the world record. Like I felt like I was a part of the team that helped him get there. Mm -hmm. So like for me, that was a success. beautiful. Like, and, and it was, it was a celebration, a, uh, celebration mm -hmm. Australia. But it's like everything we do, 
uh, sometimes things don't go the way we expect them to go. And that's that's okay because then it it's determines how we take that event. It determines where we'll go with it. You can like take that and let it destroy you. You can beat yourself down for something you you did, or you can take that and say, okay, I'm going to use that to motivate myself to to work harder, to like learn new tactics, to like grow into. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I feel like that is an important yeah. element. The two lessons that I extract from that are one, when you make it about something more than yourself, i.e., celebrating your friend or you know, having the gratitude for contributing to his record, that ameliorates the the sting of defeat because it's not about you and your ego. It's about more than that, which keeps you in the sport longer and keeps it fresh and interesting and encouraging no matter the result. And then the second lesson being this capacity or reflex to develop the muscle of being enthusiastic about what you learn when things don't go your way mm -hmm. and being stoked about it. Like, oh my God, it didn't go my way, but look what I got out of this and I can apply this next time as opposed to mm -hmm. the self-defeating, you know, kind of impulse to beat yourself up and feel bad because you didn't reach your goal. And I think those are lessons that are applicable no matter what you're trying to achieve in your yeah. life. And as a cross-country coach, finding that why finding something that's bigger than you because you'll always give yourself permission to quit. If you just leave it up to you, it, you can almost always find a reason to say, you know what, this is really uncomfortable. Like yeah. I'm going to back down. But when you have something that's bigger than you, it's harder to let other people down. So I always encouraged my athletes to find something that was outside of them that they could rely on when it got tough out there in a 5K or when the weather was, you know, not ideal and they still had to race. So I think finding that why and finding that reason that's, yeah. you know, bigger than you is. And also you touched on it earlier when you said about like when it gets bad, you find like Harvey being Wolverine or a spirit animal. I used to have my athletes like really do some research and find somebody that they find, you know, at either a great athlete or somebody that they think very highly of. And, you know, when it gets tough out there, that's when you're going to kind of let yourself go and think, OK, so what would so and so do, you know, mm -hmm. and how would Harvey Lewis run up this hill or how would, you know, whoever they admired, how would that person tackle this hill? So I think getting out of your own body is something that I feel he does really well at. And I just think it's kind of the key to pushing through hard yeah, times. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about Squid Game. Okay. <laughs> so Squid Game was the international phenomenon on, on Netflix, the show that swept the world and rewrote the ratings books in, in terms of, uh, you know, audience share. I mean, the whole world was talking about that TV show. Then there was this reality show game show yeah. concept that yeah you found yourself involved in yeah. so i'm i need to know what yeah, this is all sure. about because so, um, this is like this came out of left field i saw harvey <laughs> shared a video i was like wait what like <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah and the interesting thing about it is uh we recorded it in january of 2023 so i couldn't talk about anything until now till it was right, released so it, yeah. i've been holding on to all this you know information for you know a year now so yeah, uh, Squid Game came out in 2021, I believe, and um, it was the most watched Netflix series to date, and it was shown in 94 countries. And then in 2022, they decided they were Netflix was going to produce a reality show based on the original Squid Game. So it was called Squid Game The Challenge, and it was going to be all the games and everything was going to be based on the original one. So it was kind of cool to be involved with it. It was the largest casted reality show in the history of TV wow. with the largest prize pot of $4.56 million. Do they have all the cash in a... In yes. like a lucite cube hanging from the ceiling, yes, like in the they, show. Yes, did they? <laughs> they did. How did you get involved with this? So this is how I got involved with it. I'm not even really a big TV watcher, but we did get started on Squid Game when it came out. And it's kind of dark. And I seem to kind of be drawn to those psychological type of thriller type shows. So I loved it. Uh, I don't know. Harvey is not really... No, I like the show. Like, you I mean, did. Yeah, I love the show. You yeah. did. Yeah. The Korean like yeah, culture yeah, and yeah, all that. Yeah. And the competition. Yeah. It was so, very interesting. Um, anyway, 
they started casting for the reality show and it was my 20 year old son that actually had sent me the link and said, you should apply for this. And I think what had happened, he went to apply for it, but you had to be 21. Mm. So the next best thing would be his mom. You shot one video. Just one yeah. video. So he sent me the link on a whim. I sat down, came back from running. I just got back from running like four or five miles. I was like, oh yeah, I've got this link. Clicked on it, filled out the application online. I shot one 60 second video, like in one take. Mm-hmm. And I watched it and I'm like, yep, good enough. Send it on. It's just those things. I thought, oh, I'll send off. I'll probably never hear anything. Within 24 hours, um, a casting agent from LA had texted me and we did a phone interview and then it just kind of snowballed from there. So it was a super in-depth um, process. The whole vetting took from August of 2022 until December of 2022. Just the vetting part. Yeah, so four months. Yeah, so full a lot background of like, check, full yeah, background yeah. psychological check, psychological evaluation, mm, social yeah. media check, a lot of stuff. Big deal. So it was filmed in London in January of 2023. So they flew 456 of us over to London where we were isolated three to four days prior to filming in our hotel rooms. So we weren't allowed to talk to each other. We could only come out of our hotel room like three times a day to get our pick up our food. And then we started filming. They put us all on these coach buses and bust us to the middle of this field with these two big old military hangers. And that's where it all started. <laughs> wow. And they took you through the challenges just the way they unfold pretty much in the yes. show without yeah. the dying part. Yes, without okay. the dying part. <laughs> right. But they tried to simulate oh, it yeah. as best as they could. So we had we did have these um, like ink packs on. So if we were to get eliminated, they would uh, activate our pack and it would explode. So then like, you know, this dark ink would kind of bleed out onto our shirt. <laughs> No spoilers. Everybody should watch the show. The show's doing really well on Netflix. Like we're yeah. recording this in December, but I, I checked maybe a handful of days ago and it was like in the top 10 it was still shows. The, yeah, still. It was still so a lot of people 10. are watching this show. Yes. Are you getting like stopped? Do people recognize you now because you're in this TV show? Well, you know, I teach middle school. So <laughs> okay. of course my yeah. middle schoolers are like, hey, there's that teacher that was in Squid Game. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> so that's fun. Yeah. And I have got stopped at yeah, local pharmacy, actually, when we were getting ready to leave. They were like, hey. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, it was interesting. It was fun. Yeah. You had a good time. They're casting for season two. Oh, they're doing it again. Wow. They think Would they you ever go to the audio show? Uh, no. I don't think so. <laughs> no. no. I always said no. I'm, I'm that was... publicly exposed enough. Right. You know, I, don't <laughs> need, <laughs> I don't need any more of that. I'm fulfilled with this form of media, I think. I'm okay with this. That was yeah, the first yeah. time that I had applied to yeah. a reality show. It's got to be disorienting to go someplace, be isolated. It's sort of like you're on jury duty and you just get mm-hmm. bust around. You have no control over your life. Yes. Yeah. And also, because it's reality TV, of course, they're manipulating things. Yes. And you realize like, oh, this isn't a documentary like yeah. this is you know <laughs> this is its own entirely yeah. you know unique thing yeah. But the sets were amazing. I mean, when mm. you would walk into a set, it was literally like stepping onto the set of the movie Squid yeah. Game. I would assume that on some level you were cast because of your background in endurance athletics. How did that come into play? for better or worse as a contestant? I think, without giving too much away, I think it helped and it hindered me in some situations. But definitely when I was there, all I kept thinking is like, I ran through Death Valley and it was 124 degrees. Yeah, no one else <laughs> here did that. Nobody else. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. the honey badger monarch wolverine in this <laughs> survived that cold yeah. hanger for quite okay. some time. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, so, so that, that was difficult. I there do. were people that were passing out mm-hmm. near you. Yeah, like, there, they, was there was some, a couple people passing yeah. out in that that particular. Wow, scene. it was yeah. The conditions uh, definitely in the first game was it was rough. For sure. It was cold. So it was th- very cold. Yeah, and you'll see it in the All first right, well, episode. It just, it just bumped to the top of my queue. I'll, <laughs> I'll check it out. We've been going a long time, and I got to let you guys get back to your life. But I, I do want to kind of end with a couple quick questions. I mean, Jesse, as I mentioned, you know, shared a few questions. One of the things that he wanted to know was you, Harvey, being the Superman of running, how do you handle lazy people in your inner circle? That is a Hmm. great question. 
Because you're a very compassionate man. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, But honestly, you're not a lazy man. No, <laughs> no. I try to try to find like a little way to try to like nudge people in a, in a positive way. So it depends on the situation. Like if I'm in school, like I know I have to be careful with kids and like leave them with more positives. I have friends growing up that had a, a teacher say something like, you'll never amount to anything. Like that's outrageous. Like for someone to say something like that. I want to be very encouraging with my words, like where I like am dealing with like students. Like I want to like nudge them in a way that like motivates them. Now, if it's one of my close friends and they're being lazy or someone in my inner circle, uh, you tell them you're going to send Mike Fremont like, over to their I know, house. I, I do try to like, you know, I'm just like, little. we're going to go do some, <laughs> some walking. We're gonna get, this is yeah. where I say he does it in a manipulative way. Manipulative, honey. <laughs> with a smile on his face. <laughs> right. I uh, know. For example, okay, honey, if ahead. I'm tired and I'm like, oh, oh you're not lazy. You're never lazy. Oh, I, I just I don't feel like say. being lazy. No, I no, swear no, no, in no, the no, next no. two minutes, he will say something like, so I talked to Mike Fremont no, yesterday. Honey, I the did other not day, say that. And, you know, you're reading and, into that wrong. I would never say about you, honey. Uh, and I, no. I swear, this no. is how Harvey does it. It's like, he, that's the nudge. It's, it's, that's the no. nudge. Passive aggressive. Sometimes. Yeah, I don't think so. Some, okay, in a so good right. way. <laughs> right? All right. That's a good answer, right. though. I'm satisfied with okay. that answer. Okay. Um, in the Hollywood movie of Harvey Lewis's life, we're going to play a little casting couch here. Who plays Harvey in the movie? This is my question, not Jesse's. <laughs> Are you asking her, Kelly? Or? Well, you yeah, should, you should like, take a take. Don't tell okay. me you haven't thought about it. That's so bad. <laughs> Well, I mean, honestly, I think Matthew McConaughey is like he's he's just hilarious. I love like it, like his he's got his the right movies. right he's, energy he's, for you. Yeah, he's yeah. he's really great with that. So I mean, I, I I would like, I mean, yeah, that would be incredible. But uh, I don't know, honey, what do you what do you think? Kelly, who's playing Harvey? Um, You're the casting director. He's so dynamic. He can transcend different characters. Like yeah, his way, that's a good way. Sometimes I think of like uh, John Heater from Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're like, there's hey, a, there's a knuckleball in Dynamite your direction. I love yeah. Napoleon. I, I love, know you I do. Him. Yeah. I know you do. So I that's mean, fine. I know. There you go. Amazing. A little bit of a different energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's From right. like the McConaughey sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't <laughs> know that Matthew McConaughey is. This but I, right. I say that just because of like he's kind of quirky and. Even him and the movie about, oh, it's baseball. Oh, bench warmers, bench warmers. That's it. Like, he just has this quirkiness. And that's a side that a lot of people don't see of you that uh -huh. I love. And it's this, I don't know. Like, you just say weird mm, things. That's like, great, honey. <laughs> you say things like, hey, like, how many times have you came? Do you guys want to have, a, like, a popsicle party or something a tonight? A popsicle party. And my kids and myself, we're I, like. I don't think I've done that in a little while. We're honey. like. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I love popsicles. Like, are you, you know, is like, it 1950? <laughs> what else? Right. No, oh my gosh, I can I'm tell you so around. many things that he says, and my kids look at me and they're like, <laughs> you know, Mark Wahlberg. I think he'd be pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, he'd be pretty good. He's, He's gonna have to trim down a little. I know, I know. I'm gonna have to work on. It. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He or you're gonna to, have to. You're gonna have to beef up. Yeah, I saw like, the Napoleon film, and uh, you know that was actually quite a, a, amazing. You know, film too. But there was a preview. Like he's in this new film now, where he's doing these adventure races, and he's got this dog. Uh, it's coming out in the next uh -huh. few months. And I can relate in the sense of our dog. Like Carly is my number one training partner. Like our rescue dog, Carly. So a lot of people don't know that that our dog is like she has got such incredible energy and like her her mindset. Like that dog will never turn. Like she defends the front of the house. <laughs> like there could be a Tyrannosaurus Rex and she would just go straight after it yeah. without a doubt. And it's like this dog is like this tall, but it's from her pound days. Like she is just amazing. And like for her, running is an absolute gift. Every time we run, She's so like happy. she just loves so running happy. so much. Like I don't know anybody on the planet that likes running as much as Carly. So like when we run together, we're out in the country in the middle of nowhere. And we're just having so much fun, just running as hard as we can at times or just cruising along. And it's just a blast. 
Yeah, like so Wahlberg because he did this movie. <laughs> yeah, he's, and I he's, like he's his film. Okay. Yeah, I like uh, his film. I got two. I thought about this a little bit. One would be a younger Billy Bob Thornton. <laughs> a little dark. He's a, a little some darkness there, though. You know, yeah, I don't know if that matches mystery, up. So I'd balance that out with a young Ron Howard because there's a little Richie Cunningham in you, I yeah. think, too. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, those guys but, you are know, incredible. But, you know, McConaughey. Yeah. You know, what are you going to do? I know. Right? It's so mad. Well, you know. <laughs> All right. It's so mad. Um, final thing. I spent a lot of time thinking about about the nature of change, why some people are able to change, others aren't, why some are able to set goals and achieve them and others struggle. How do you think about, you know, we've talked a lot about human capacity and the fact that we all have latent potential within us that goes untapped. And you're kind of on the outer edges of trying to see where that limit might be for yourself. And that speaks to the broader issue of our all of our capacities, and I think that's your greatest influence, is getting us to reimagine what we might be capable of in our own lives. So to the person who does struggle with this, who's trying to level up or shoulder responsibility for a positive change in their life, like how do you get that person activated and on the right track towards sustainable positive change? Right now is really timing because we're coming to the end of the year and moving into the new year. And every year I like to, it's kind of like your month that you take away, I think, and, and reset yourself. I like to, to really uh, put out there a list of goals that I have for the year ahead. Like, and it can be, you know, a couple goals for me, it's like 10 or 12 goals. And like, those are the real like points I want to really invest time and like finding a routine. So routine is so critical. Whatever you start for two days, three days, it's not yet a routine. But once you get into like that second week, you've established a new routine. So just start with having some time alone with yourself in a place that you can really get into that deep thought. And, and you can start this any time of the year. But having, maybe it's easiest to start with a few goals, but start with those goals and then show up. Show up each week. If you miss a week, that's okay. Like yoga, for example. Uh, Kelly started yoga and she's been having trouble with her back that's kind of led to her knee. And like that yoga, like doing that once or twice a week has been super powerful. And like it's really helped to alleviate some of your discomfort. And, uh, you know, we missed yoga maybe this week or last week. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Um, but then, you know, it's not going to stop us from like the next week of picking that back up. So finding those powerful routines. I'm a person that's like ADHD. I also sometimes run from like uh, being a type A, like super dialed in with every single thing having to be a certain way. But on the other hand, I also see the power of the routines. So like every Monday going into bigs, I had started the yoga. And mm -hmm. like the yoga is really powerful because it's not something I, I routinely do. But in the like five or six weeks leading up, it was also helping with like the mental aspect. And so putting down those goals. And I feel like writing them down is, is, is so powerful. And even telling someone you trust is so powerful because then it holds you more accountable yeah. than if it's just in your mind and it's sort of fleeting. But when you write it down and then it's somewhere where you see it, like it might be in your calendar, your planner, or maybe somewhere on the wall, it's powerful. Like, I feel like having something that we're driving towards each year that's involves some level of growth somewhere with relationships or with work or with our athletics or, or wherever it is like that's that's really a, something that will give you m more back mm -hmm. and, and so that's where i would start with them mm -hmm. i think with people like that are struggling with getting a routine because i think it starts before that it's easy to say like you know get into a routine of doing this but something else comes right before that and that's taking the action to do it. And I think a lot of people are waiting for motivation or they're waiting for that feeling of like, well, once I feel like I want to do this, you know, then I'll start. My biggest thing that I've taken away when I've coached students and adults is don't wait for 
the motivation because that's a fleeting feeling and we can't always control the way we feel. So you have to just show up. Whether And that's the one thing I think you have to make that commitment to yourself with yourself that even when I feel like I don't want to go here, even when I feel like I don't want to get out of bed 45 minutes earlier than normal, I'm going to make that commitment to myself right now that I'm still going to do it. And that's where I think a lot of people falter when they come to like having to create a routine or make a routine or set goals is that they're always like, but I don't feel like doing this. But then once that routine gets established, that's when you feel euphoria and you feel good and you feel better about yourself. So I I think that would be mine, would be that, you know, having people understand that you don't always have to feel motivated to go do this and you're not. So Very good advice, yes. In fact, how you feel about doing the thing really shouldn't have anything to do do with with the doing of the thing itself. Uh, I beat this drum all the time, mood follows action, or to quote Dr. Andrew Huberman, action first, thoughts, feelings, and perceptions follow. 100%. But we do have this instinct where we want to wait until we feel like doing the thing. And we also want to know how it's going to play out. We want to know what that roadmap is going to look like and where and when the destination will be arrived upon. And you don't get to have that. That's a privilege that doesn't exist. So developing that reflex to action or that inclination towards action, irrespective of how you feel about it, is the thing that gets you out of bed when you don't want to get out of bed or out the door when it's freezing cold or raining or, you know, choose your adventure. Absolutely. So... Yeah. You agree with that, Harvey? I'd say so. Yeah. It's like, uh, I don't know. I struggle with this with my students. I want all my students to succeed. <laughs> and then like, like my buddy, Greg Armstrong, he's a science teacher down in Tennessee. And like just, he gets kids out in experiential learning. I mean, he's taking kids to Africa or to Central America every three months. And he even built an amphitheater in the back of their school by hand with his students. I mean, it's like those sort of experiential learning, they have like a powerful impact when you get to go and like uh, interact with someone who's like living in a developing country with no access to water. And like they're building these well water with the run for water. It's like, that has some sort of spark that goes even beyond these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, like, yeah, I think that's a really, that's an insightful kind of caveat to this whole thing. I mean, I think what Kelly's talking about is how do you develop the resourcefulness to welcome discomfort into your life? And and you're really speaking to the idea of how do you get somebody really excited about the journey of learning and expanding your kind of the aperture of your life experience, right? And as somebody who's every day dealing with young minds and thinking about how do I get this person interested or excited about this material, there's an emotional connection that you have to create and immersive experiential situations are obviously going to engender that. And there is something lasting about that that can then create a trajectory for for a young person. So I think that is a really insightful thought. I think we did it. I think we <laughs> right, did it. I think we're done. Thank, Thank you so much. How do you guys much. feel? Yeah, I feel Good. amazing. I mean, honestly, it was a blast. Uh, and it was a total surprise. Like, we had no idea that Kelly was going to hop no, in for good. a couple of questions. Thank you for uh, leaping in the chair. We never did this. You never like, have. Good. Like, no, it's therapeutic. No, like it, yeah, it is okay. very therapeutic. Let's get it's honest. Like, uh, it's, it's like... Uh, Man, a, he dream, really man. he's an amazing person i mean oh, he honey. he mails me letters he'll mail me a card in the mail like i'll <laughs> no, just honey, go you, you honey, are not you lazy are, honey like, no. i'll never and all those things no you you do but, just keeps getting you better do he's like, like, harvey just keeps starting looking like, better and better we've, so we've, I, I thought you were gonna come on here and it's like come on let me tell you and then you just shine a brighter light on this guy i know i know but i really i mean i do know i mean there are some other things like but for the most part no yeah we'll be on vacation and like a month later i'll check my mail and i'll have like a postcard from where harvey sent me a a postcard while we were on vacation together like i'm having a great time with you in wherever we're at and i'm just like who does this all right well hurry up and get married you guys (laughs) all right uh 
Um, <laughs> Harvey, hey, man, congratulations. So like just, you know, so much respect for, for not just these extraordinary athletic feats, but, but really how you comport yourself as a human being and the way that you exude the values that are important to you. And, you know, I really do think it's heroic and it is the type and archetype of hero that we need now more than ever in this weird divided world that we find ourselves in. And what you do cuts through that noise. You know, it really is a signal in the noise. And I appreciate you. I'm Thank here you, to support Rich. you. You are my spirit animal. Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm not going with the monarch total, or the honey uh, bat. I'm I going with the Harvey. I said, I said, and, uh, you're a hero. Yeah. And like, honestly, like <laughs> I remember listening to your podcast as I'm out there running long runs and just you have been able to do things that are amazing. I mean, the uh, fact that you've had like the number of people you've had on this, just the realm of different like backgrounds, like it's just incredible. Yeah. So, oh, I mean, thank I, you. It's, it's been like, a fun journey. I ran into a runner this morning, like up on the mountain. I was coming down, she was going up, and Kimberly from Virginia, and she's like, uh, Oh, yeah, I love Rich. I love Rush. And what he did for his daughter was amazing for her birthday. Oh, that's yeah. right. You just celebrated yeah. her birthday. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like you, you're you hitting people. After our episode, the last one, I went to Cyprus, like, for spring break, like, a few months after that. And, like, in Cyprus, there were, like, all these people in Cyprus that had, oh, yeah, we love the ritual episode. Oh, cool. oh yeah. And so Great, it's man. crazy. That, can you imagine it? You have people... In like over a hundred countries, like listening to it's you. It's great. Freaks me yeah. out a little bit. Yeah, it's know. really wild, man. And I all get you guys, all up in my head team, or whatever. Like, it's a whole but team this is a team effort, obviously. Yeah. As you can see, everyone just yeah. sees the black curtains, but you know, it's not just me. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. I truly hope you enjoyed the conversation. To learn more about today's guest, including links and resources related to everything discussed today, visit the episode page at richroll.com where you can find the entire podcast archive, as well as podcast merch, my books, Finding Ultra, Voicing Change and the Plant Power Way, as well as the Plant Power Meal Planner at meals.richroll.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, the easiest and most impactful thing you can do is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and on YouTube, and leave a review and or comment. Supporting the sponsors who support the show is also important and appreciated, and sharing the show or your favorite episode with friends or on social media is, of course, awesome and very helpful. And finally, for podcast updates, special offers on books, the meal planner, and other subjects, please subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find on the footer of any page at richroll.com. Today's show was produced and engineered by Jason Camiolo with additional audio engineering by Kale Curtis. The video edition of the podcast was created by Blake Curtis with assistance by our creative director, Dan Drake. Portraits by Davey Greenberg, graphic and social media assets courtesy of Daniel Solis, Thank you, Georgia Whaley, for copywriting and website management. And of course, our theme music was created by Tyler Pyatt, Trapper Pyatt, and Harry Mathis. Appreciate the love. Love the support. See you back here soon. Peace. Plants. Namaste.